Okay, sounds good. And your chairman will be Rod Van Pernis. Sorry, can you say again? Your, your chairman will be Rod Van Pernis. Ah, excellent. Thank you. Thirty minutes. Sounds good. People are starting to come back. our next talk, um, which is another online talk. And um, I'm very happy to have Peter McMahon give this uh, talk on uh, photonic neural networks using linear nonlinear optics. I hope you can hear us. Yes, loud and clear. So then the stage is yours. Great. Well, thank you very much for the, inf for the introduction. And uh, thanks very much to the organizers for the, the invitation to speak. Um, really sad I couldn't be there in person, uh, but I, I look forward to visiting at some point in the future. And I hope everyone who is, is there in person is, uh, is having a good time. So uh, as, uh, as the introduction said, I'm gonna talk about photonic neural networks. And uh, if I understand the uh, theme of the workshop, basically there are, uh, two major themes is how one can use machine learning to help in photonics in general. Um, and then there's how we can use photonics to do machine learning. And this talk is gonna be about this uh, second, uh, maybe half one might say of the, the theme of the workshop. Uh, so if anything in my, my talk uh, sounds maybe confusing about whether it could be one of these two things, it's, it's, uh, it's the latter. So before I go into the technical material, um, I'll put up a photograph of, or a slide of my uh, of my group because I'm here really to do uh, the advertising of the work that actually happens that is done by these people. Uh, uh, the, the, the set of people here on the on the top are the postdocs in the group, and then the PhD students 
And I've also put the names of a few undergrads uh, for the undergrads who are involved in the research that I'll present today. And uh, since this, especially since this is a school and I imagine there are a number of PhDs uh, who are attending, uh, my group is always recruiting. So if you're interested in a postdoc position now or a year from now or two or three years from now, uh, please feel free to get in touch whenever is an appropriate time for you. Uh, also, the work that I'll show today has been primarily funded by NTT and the National Science Foundation in the US. So the basic outline I have for the, uh, for the hour is the following. Um, I'm going to first talk a little bit about neural networks and give neural, a description of neural networks and uh, maybe the nomenclature that I'm going to use in the talk just to set the, uh, the words that we use uh, so that everyone's on the same page about what I mean by various terms. Uh, I fully expect that everyone attending the workshop uh, has come across neural networks before. Uh, so I won't try to give it an in-depth description, but I'll try to set the set the phrasing of how, of what I mean by various words, and then uh, I'm going to try and give some longer motivation than I would in a normal research talk, uh, because this is a school, giving motivation for really why and how we would want to improve the energy efficiency of neural networks and what the potential role of photonics in this is. I'll then go over three examples of. Uh, optical neural network experiments that have been done in my group. Um, but not to say that these are, of course, the only or the best, um, but these are the ones I'm most familiar with because my group did them. Uh, and I hope that you will hear other examples from other groups throughout the rest of the school this week. Um, the first example is going to be uh, building optical neural networks where the optical part will be done with linear optics. Uh, and a, a key aspect of this will be performing neural network calculations where you use an extraordinarily small amount of light or optical energy, less than one photon per scalar multiplication. Uh, and we're able to show that this still works. In the second example, I'll talk about how to construct optical neural networks using nonlinear optics. Uh, and as I think probably everybody in the school already knows, in neural networks, nonlinearity is a very important ingredient of how to get neural networks to function well, and so it's natural to, uh, to want to explore how to use nonlinear optics in them. And in particular, I'll show how to use a frequency conversion process uh, for machine learning. And then finally, I'll give an example of an application of optical neural networks to a task that I call image sensing. Uh, and I'll describe when we get to this in, in more detail about what exactly we mean by this. But really, this is a, a project that we've uh, embarked on where we're motivated by trying to eliminate one of the bottlenecks, the electronics to optics bottleneck that appears in uh, normal optical neural networks when one is trying to directly compete with a, a GPU as an alternative to a, a GPU or a CPU or some other electronic processor. So that's the grand plan. Um, I'm very happy to take questions throughout the talk. So please feel free to interrupt if anyone has any questions and I'm not at all insistent on finishing all the slides. So if I if we get through the hour and there's material left over, that's totally fine by me. I'd, I'd much rather have an interactive session. Uh, so don't be shy. All right, well, with that, let's talk a little bit about, um, again, words. Uh, what do we mean by various things? So first of all, I would like to remind about the distinction between inference and training in machine learning. Uh, and the reason that I especially want to focus on this is that almost everything that I'll talk about in this talk today will be towards uh, producing photonic systems that can improve machine learning in the inference mode and not in the training mode. So what do we mean by this? Well, inference is again, if you are given some trained model and an image of a, for example, a handwritten digit, the inference mode or the inference phase of machine learning is making a prediction of what that digit is. We're given a picture of a handwritten digit, eight here, as well as the model that was trained to make predictions about handwritten digits, and it makes a prediction that this was an eight. As opposed to training, which is, of course, the phase where you're given a labeled data set, uh, at least in, uh, in classified learning. So you have a whole bunch of examples of handwritten zeros, and you're told that all of these are zero, and a whole bunch of examples of handwritten ones, and you're told that all of these are one, and so on. And the goal is given this labeled data set uh, to produce a trained model that then gets used in the inference phase. So again, the, 
the things that I'm going to be talking about today are we need to have training needs to have happened so that there is a model, but for any place where we're looking to get an advantage in speed or energy or some other metric, uh, we're going to be doing inference. And why is, the, why is this a reasonable thing to focus on? Uh, well, it's in the title of the slide here is that inference costs in some settings can dominate. They can be up to 80 or 90% of the total costs of machine learning in dollars or euros. Uh, it can be cost in energy, can be cost in speed. And the reason for this is that uh, if you have a team of machine learning engineers training some model and that you have maybe sort of five or 10 or maybe a hundred engineers, if you have a really big team uh, and they, they train them, they train some models, they produce them, and then those models get used by, can be literally millions of people a day. Uh, and so this is really the intuition for why inference uh, can dominate. It's in the context of basically cloud deployed machine learning models, which is uh, many of the models that exist today. And uh, where does this number come from? Well, there's a few different sources, for example, Amazon, when they introduced an inference, uh, a specialized inference processor a couple of years ago, uh, noted this 90% figure. Uh, same figures come from companies like NVIDIA who produce GPUs that are widely used in machine learning for inference uh, and uh, some uh, sort of broader uh, uh, figures from, uh, from McKinsey from a report from a few years ago. So there's a general consensus. This is somewhat of a reasonable number. Uh, and the, the intuition is again, as I said, uh, that you train, in some sense, train once and then use many, many times or for many, many people. So now to go on to neural networks themselves. And uh, again, I imagine everybody's seen this. So this is just going to be quick to, to set the language that I use in the talk. Uh, if we're doing inference and we're trying to make a prediction of this handwritten eight is an eight, the most canonical form of neural network we have is a standard feed forward sort of multi-layer perceptron. Uh, that I've put a cartoon of here, where you have layers of neurons, and each layer you can think of as, uh, as a vector, where each neuron's value uh, is an element of that vector. And the information propagates from the input where we encode the pixel values into each, uh, into the neurons at the, in the first layer. And this information is propagated by matrix vector multiplications. Where to go from the first layer to the second layer, we multiply this vector by a matrix that encodes these weights between the, the layers of the, of the connections between the layers. And in the training process, it is these weights of the, the matrices that are, that are trained, that are tuned such that when you put in an eight, you get out an answer of an eight. When you put in a seven, you get an answer of a seven and so on. So if you were going to try and build a, a hardware accelerator to help with the inference of uh, machine learning models like this, or in particular neural network models, you essentially have two choices of how you can build your accelerator. You can either try to make accelerators that have an exact mathematical equivalence with this diagram that I just showed, where you really try to make a, a new form of hardware processor that exactly does the same thing as was shown here. It literally is doing the matrix vector multiplication as an electronic processor would, or a conventional digital electronic processor would. And if you do this, uh, the big pro is that you can then take some model that was trained for a, a neural network that was trained for a CPU or GPU or TPU and the weights that you would use that are, are trained, you can exactly use them again in your new accelerator. And uh, the goal there is make an accelerator that exactly does this mathematical operation, but just does it faster or with lower energy uh, than, a, than a CPU or a GPU or a TPU could. The con of this approach is that you need to now very carefully engineer your physical system so that you are making a, a, an exact equivalence, that you are actually doing a matrix vector multiplication exactly as the training was assuming. And this careful engineering can really leave energy on the table. So that any time in engineering where you impose constraints, if you want exactly this function to happen, now you need to go slower or use more resources than, uh, than you would if you were looser about things. So the alternative is to try and make an accelerator that just has an approximate equivalence with this kind of mathematical structure that I introduced. And 
there, the pro is that you can imagine making hardware that's much more energy efficient because now you're not forcing it to do something that it didn't necessarily naturally do. Um, or even if, it, even if you were forcing it a little bit, not forcing it to be exact can, uh, can really allow you to make some savings. Uh, but the, the con of this approach is now the, the weights that were trained in a, for this multi-layer perceptron on the left on a, on a computer are uh, essentially almost meaningless for something that doesn't exactly do this mathematical operation anymore. So now you need to retrain your models. And I think the, the, the first category of accelerator where there's an exact equivalence is hopefully reasonably intuitive and something you've probably seen before. Uh, and I'll give another example of this in this, uh, in this talk. The second category maybe some, might sound a little bit odd. It's less conventional. Uh, and I will show an example in some detail of what I mean by this. So if this approximate equivalence business sounds a little bit strange, uh, don't worry, you will, you will see an example fairly soon. Uh, something I should also mention is that I've set up this dichotomy between exact and approximate equivalence because those are you know, convenient words to use in the English language. But actually by approximate, it's, that's not even necessary. It turns out that we can make accelerators that are just merely vaguely inspired as a perceptron has uh, or a feed forward network in general. Uh, so uh, we will, again, we'll see more of that in a bit. Quick question. This is really quit, but it hasn't actually seemed to quit for me. Can everybody still hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oops. Uh, all right. Now it seems like it's upset. Okay. Hang on a second uh, while I. We, we could hear you all the time, Peter. Huh? So it was fine. Okay. Sounds good. I'm going to just uh, put the error message to the side then and try reshare and see what happens. Uh, all right. Is it sharing again? Starting to. All right. Uh, let, let, let me know if uh, if the audio stops. Great. So so this is the the yeah the the set of sort of two. two and now before I give some examples of uh, your, 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 your slide is not up yet. Wait. Ah. It started on me. Maybe I should restart Zoom because it, it claims that it's up. So let's see what to do about that. Everyone, sorry about this. Let's see. All right, is our slides back? It's back. Yeah. All right, and audio is back. Excellent. Sorry about that. Hopefully, this is the last time it dies. Although, given that it's Zoom, I can't make any guarantees. All right, so I've introduced these two different categories of hardware accelerator that you could imagine for uh, trying to accelerate neural networks. Uh, and the other thing I should quickly mention is that I put accelerators in quotes because uh, to a large extent, what people are trying to do, both in photonics and in other physical hardware platforms, for making accelerators for neural networks is really making things that maybe go faster than a standard uh, electronic digital processor. But often, it's really about trying to improve the energy efficiency of the system. Uh, but both cases where you're trying to make it go faster or have higher throughput, or where you're trying to make it have better energy efficiency, both of these get lumped under the term accelerators. So before I tell you about some of the ways in which we can make photonic accelerators for neural networks, I wanted to give a, a little bit of background on or context on what is the competition? What do we have to beat if we would like to, to actually have photonic processes and have an impact versus what is the state of the art in electronics now? So the state of the art uh, in electronics is basically a, a, a GPU, a graphics processing unit. And this is 
I, I think of as the baseline competition for we need to be able to beat this if we're going to be able to produce something that is actually uh, you would want to use as an alternative to uh, uh, electronics. So if you if you this is photonics as competition. This picture here is of a, a Nvidia H100 card, which is their most recent device, and this table here comes from Nvidia's spec sheet. And the two kind of most relevant numbers in the spec sheet for our purposes are the ones that I've highlighted in red here. There's uh, the int eight uh, operations per second and the power consumption of the card. So let's drill into these a little bit. So first of all, there's a whole bunch of different types of performance or types of operations uh, that performance metrics are given for. Uh, and why am I highlighting this one here that's int eight? Well, int eight refers to eight bit integer arithmetic. And this is really, there's two reasons that I highlighted. One is that this is what analog computations, including photonics can hope to achieve. Uh, if you're building an analog processor, it's very difficult to imagine achieving much more than eight bits of precision in integer, uh, integer precision. Uh, you could maybe have nine or 10 bits of precision. The 10 bits of precision would correspond to having an error of one part in a thousand, which is already pretty difficult to achieve in an analog setting. Um, so this is, uh, this is the relevant performance to compare against because uh, for example, floating point 32 is not something that we can imagine achieving in a, an analog setting. I think I saw a hand go up, but then it went down. Did somebody have a question? If not, I'll proceed. The other side of it is, so one reason we picked the int eight number is, well, that's what photonic analog machines may be able to produce or achieve. Uh, the other side is that, uh, why does this number even appear on NVIDIA's chart is that this is often the precision that is used in inference in current machine learning models. Um, I have to specify inference because it's typically in training machine learning models, which people also use GPUs for, uh, the pre precision used is higher. But once you go to inference, people are using int8 and sometimes even int4. Uh, so this is a, a good match between what photonics can achieve and what people in the machine learning community actually already use and want. Now let's think about these numbers a little bit and what they mean for us as a, as a target. Uh, the clock speed of uh, this device is probably between one and two gigahertz. I don't think it's been, a, the exact number has been announced yet, but let's assume for now it's, it's one gigahertz. And that means that in one clock cycle, or one clock cycle takes one nanosecond. Uh, this is gonna be relevant in a, in, a, in a bit. So now the next thing we can do is we can say, okay, what does this 4,000 tops number mean? Well, this is, 4,000 tera operations per second. In other words, four times by 10 to the 15 operations per second. And where operations here means int eight multiply accumulate operations. So it's a combination of a, a scalar multiplication and an, addition, and, an, and an addition. This is a very, very large number of operations. Uh, so, but this is, this, is the, this is really where things, uh, where things stand, but to give uh, another perspective on sort of how large this number is. If we think about the clock cycle being one nanosecond, we can ask, well, how many operations are happening in just a single clock cycle in one nanosecond? It turns out that in this, in this case here, about 4 million operations are happening every clock cycle, every nanosecond. So that gives us a pretty strong constraint and intuition on how good our photonic systems would have to be. If we think about sending data into a photonic system every nanosecond, so at a gigahertz clock rate, that means we have to, in order to even just be at parity with this, we have to do 4 million operations uh, per clock cycle or per period where we're sending data in. Uh, and that suggests that, well, there's two, two, two main options you can see for how do we beat that. Well, one is, well, let's try to do way more operations than this per clock cycle, so per nanosecond. Uh, but 10 to the six is already a, a pretty large amount of multiplexing. And the alternative, is, another alternative is we could try and make our clock grow much faster than the, than the one, net, one nanosecond that was possible in the electronic system. Uh, but still, this is, this is really why, this number is really why uh, 
it's so difficult to beat a GPU at machine learning. They're highly optimized for it and they go very, very fast. Another number that's important to note is, like I said, we're not in building photonic accelerators. We're not only interested in speed, but also the energy efficiency. And so the number to beat here is 1.75 times 10 to the minus 13 joules per Mac operation. Uh, so in other words, about a 175 femtojoules per Mac. Um, and this includes not just the arithmetic itself, but also the cost of loading from memory and storing to memory and so on. It's an all-inclusive cost. Uh, and so this is, again, also a, a very difficult number to beat, but it's important to know because this is the target. Uh, and the reason I'm emphasizing all this so much is that GPUs have really made a lot of progress in the last few years. And if you look at GPU numbers from even twos, but especially five years ago, and you use that as a baseline for what you should beat with a photonic accelerator, you'll be way off the mark on what you actually need to achieve to beat what's currently state of the art. Another kind of interesting thing you might think about is what, how does a GPU manage to achieve so much? How can it, how can it be so good? And part of the reason is well, that it's heavily optimized. The other part is that it contains 80 billion transistors. Um, so the number of transistors used per multiplication per clock cycle is, uh, is in some sense a, a quite a high overhead. Of course, the chip is not just arithmetic units. It has a lot of control logic and a lot of memory. Uh, but if you think about it in terms of, well, how many operations, the number of operations per clock cycle was about 4 million and it used 80 billion transistors. So you know, some factor of maybe 10,000 transistors to do one, one, one scalar multiplication. Uh, like I said, it's a, that's a little bit heuristic and uh, I don't know, unfair, but you need to be a little careful in interpreting that because there's still memory and control and so on. But still, this is, this is how it manages to do a million operations in a clock cycle is that it has way more transistors than that per operation. Another way to look at the competitive landscape for what does photonics have to beat is to look at a plot like this, which shows uh, peak power of the, uh, the electronic processor versus the peak performance that you can achieve with it. So the number of operations per second. Uh, and I've put in a red star here, this NVIDIA H100 from the previous slide. This figure comes from a, from a review paper uh, from about a year ago. So it's pretty up to date. And in this plot going in this diagonal direction is, uh, is good. So we would like to use less, less power and get more operations per second, but even just going straight up is also, is also good. The best is to go up left, but even just going straight up is good. Um, and you can see these kind of frontiers of operations per watt where electronics is all pretty much clustered below some threshold of about 10 teraops per watt. So if you can go above that in photonics, then you're winning. Uh, again, you need to be a little careful about well, which precision did people mean, uh, because it's the int eights and and below that are relevant to photonics here, not not all of the floating point ones. So why why would you use optics to build neural network accelerators? Now that I've painted the, this, this picture of electronics is uh, really really uh, performant. So why would we try use optics to build neural network accelerators? There are a few reasons, um, and I've listed. Uh, well, given the names of just a couple of them here that I'll, I'll go through briefly. So the first is, that's maybe a, quite a striking difference between photonics and electronics is that in principle, there's about a hundred thousand X larger bandwidth that's accessible to you in, in photonics than in electronics. Uh, photonics can have a bandwidth of visible wavelengths of 500 ish terahertz. Whereas mm -hmm. of course the bandwidth that you get in, typically in electronic processes is less than five gigahertz. So this is something that you could try to take advantage of and, and in optical communications, uh, people already take advantage of the broadband with the photonics to be able to send more information down a fiber than you would um, through a, an electronic cable. Uh, but it's not something that you automatically get. You need to engineer the system to take advantage of it. You can't, um, for example, just use a CW laser and modulate it extremely slowly and magically get some benefit from photonics. Uh, it's, a, it's a property of photonic that's available to you, but you need to, uh, you need to build it into your system you need to, to somehow take advantage of it. And uh, I think the two helpful, at least for me, intuitions about how this bandwidth advantage could, uh, 
the benefit you is one way to think about it is the that in the similar sense to optical communications, giving you a large amount of frequency multiplexing or wavelength multiplexing, uh, where operations can happen on each frequency or wavelength uh, independently and parallel. Uh, that's one way to think about how bandwidth benefit can benefit you. And another way is more literally in the sense of clock rate of we tend to not clock electronics faster than five gigahertz, but you could literally do operations that take femtoseconds uh, with optics. Uh, again, you need to engineer your system to actually take advantage of that, though, because if you only do one operation that takes a that takes femtoseconds every second, then you haven't won. You need to you need to keep feeding the system. So it's it's tricky, but this is what's available to you. Another fairly striking uh, property of optics that's useful to try and exploit in uh, a neural network accelerator is spatial parallelism. I think we all have good intuition for. Uh, optics can be highly spatially parallel because we all have cell phones that have maybe between one and 10 million pixels. And it's a consumer electronics device uh, that consumes maybe a watt of power and is relatively inexpensive. Uh, so there's a large number of spatial noise that, that are available uh, and it's something that you can harness. Now, in some sense, electronics has better spatial parallelism because a, a transistor is much smaller than the fraction limited spot in optics. Uh, but it, spatial parallelism is still something that it's generally pretty good to be able to exploit. And this is something that my group works quite a lot on. A third feature of optics that is really one of the main motivations for why you would want to try and use optics to build neural network accelerators is that photons, when they propagate through free space or even in some on-chip settings, the light propagates through the system with nearly no energy loss, just whatever is lost by the absorption of the photons. Uh, which can be pretty small, and they perform computation by their mere propagation. Uh, uh, I think that maybe the most canonical example of this is if you have a lens, it's performing a Fourier transform you, for you without any energy consumption other than the lost absorbed photons in the lens. But again, uh, you need to, to engineer the whole system to actually take advantage of this, and something you really need to be careful about, which will which I'll uh, give more examples of it later in the talk, or that you really have to watch out for the input output cost. And what I mean by this is you need to somehow still get your information into optics in the first place. And once you send, for example, your light through a lens, you need to somehow detect it maybe with a, a camera and convert it back from optics to electronics. And you need to account for these costs when you're designing the system. Uh, so it's, uh, Dissipation in this dynamic sounds really promising. It sounds like we'll be able to build very, very energy efficient uh, computers using optics. And we believe that that should, uh, it should be true, but it's not just you get it totally for free. You need to, uh, you, you need to be careful in the engineer. A fourth point, which is not something that I'll really uh, give an example of today, but I think it's kind of one that's fun to think about. Uh, is wave physics, is that in optics, uh, it's relatively easy to exploit the wave nature of individual photons. Uh, there are even undergraduate lab experiments where people build, for example, Mach Zender interferometers with single photons. But it's pretty difficult to exploit the wave nature of ind individual electrons. Uh, and this is, well, it's a difference between optics and electronics that you could think about how to try and exploit this. Uh, it's not something we, that I'm going to show in any of the experiments that we have. And it's also this is carefully phrased about individual photons and individual electrons, because in electronics, you can also exploit interference phenomena if you are doing microwave electronics. But there, then the microwaves have long wavelengths, so you don't get as much spatial parallelism. So there's, there can be some interesting benefits to optics from this as well. Uh, it's something to think about, and maybe chat, and chat about in the, in, the, in the coffee sessions. So those are the... Those, those are some of the ingredients. They're not necessarily all of them, but I think especially the first three are really the main ones that I'm going to focus on today. So now I'm going to go through a few concrete examples of things that we've done in my lab that are similar or related to things that have happened in other groups, but I'm going to talk about the ones that we did, uh, where we try to exploit some of these properties to build optical neural networks. And in this first example, we're going to use linear optics only. Uh, and we're going to, the, the key Part of this example is that we're going to show that we can use a very, very small amount of uh, optical power to do uh, scalar multiplications as part of a matrix vector multiplication. 
And this gets to really both spatial parallelism as well as this nearly dissipation of dynamics. And uh, this work was, uh, was led by Tian Yu Wang, who's a postdoc in my group, and uh, he worked with a PhD student, uh, Xi Yun Ma. So the, the core building block that we're going to be constructing is an optical matrix vector multiplier, so a matrix vector multiplier that's built out of optics. And uh, there's a number of different efforts that are going on around the world where people are doing this. For example, there's a large number of people doing on-chip matrix vector multipliers. Here's an example from a uh, slide from Dirk England, who's at MIT. And I think you'll be hearing from, uh, from Marin Solicic later in the week, um, where uh, uh, Marin and Dirk's groups have been doing uh, really interesting work on using on-chip devices to perform matrix vector multiplications and show how they can be useful in neural networks. An alternative approach to on-chip approaches is to use free space. Uh, and the free space approach to building optical matrix vector multipliers goes back quite a long time to at least the 1970s. This diagram here shows a scheme that, uh, that goes back to Joe Goodman, but was redrawn in 2010. So the scheme itself is from the 1970s, but uh, redrawn in nicer color uh, in 2010. And the, the basic idea of this kind of free space matrix vector multiplier is you have a vector that you encode with an array of, for example, pixels or LEDs, and you use a cylindrical lens to fan them out to make copies of each element of the vector. And you send those uh, copies through a spatial light modulator that encodes the matrix you would like to multiply the vector by. And then you have another cylindrical lens to collapse the, uh, these multiplied scalar products. And ultimately, these are the, these, uh, this lens here is performing a summation uh, on a detector. And now you have one detector per element of the output vector. And the, you can think about the way that the multiplications are happening is that the spatial light modulator is inten modulating the intensity of the beam that goes through each pixel. And so if you, if you, if you have 100% transmission, then you multiply it by one. And if you have 0% transmission, you multiply it by zero. And of course, you can have anything between zero and one. And so this uh, is a scheme that lets you, in intensity, multiply by positive, uh, well, lets you multiply positive vectors by positive matrices. And it's this kind of scheme that we're going to be focusing on. Uh, these are just two examples of ways you can build optical matrix vector multipliers. There are many more. Um, there's a number of nice review papers and others that I put out uh, references on the bottom of the slide here. So I'm going to, well, what I've put up here is a diagram of a free space multi matrix vector multiplier that is the way that we build it. And it's a little bit different than the one that I showed here. So I'll explain what we're doing uh, and then some aspect of the energy efficiency of this, at least in optical energy. So in the scheme we do it, it's the same basic idea as the Goodman scheme, but instead of doing things with lines of pixels and LEDs, we can do 2D grids. So here, each color represents an element, a different element of a vector. So we have some light source, so for example, a two by two array of LEDs that encodes some four dimensional vector that has these four elements, the blue, yellow, green, and red ones. And these are then fanned out. Uh, and one way to do fan out is, for example, by using a micro lens array, where if you look at, uh, for example, LEDs on your phone, uh, if you look at it from some angle or another angle, you see multiple copies of the phone. Uh, and it, if you have an array of micro lenses, you can then basically form collimated uh, versions of these multiple copies of the LED outputs. So now you have, in this case, imagining uh, four fanned out copies. And these four fanned out copies are gonna be transmitted through a spatial light modulator that will again encode the matrix you would like to multiply the vector by. Then we have a set of four lenses that are going to um, focus the light on, onto four different detectors. And these lenses and the detectors are performing the summation uh, of the relevant parts of the matrix vector product. So this is, this is the construction we have for performing matrix vector uh, multiplication with intensity uh, modulation scheme. And a, an interesting question one could ask is how many photons do you need uh, to perform a, an accurate matrix vector multiplication? So in the example or in the diagram below, we just showed four pixels, but really if we imagine scaling this up, you can have a lens where you're having a whole array of, uh, of beams going into it, each corresponding to one of the scalar matrix, scalar products in the matrix vector product. And if you have a 
n dimensional vector there will, and an n by n matrix, then at each lens, there will be n beams coming into it that are then all gonna be focused down and summed on one detector. And the intuition for the number of photons you need that we have is that at the detector, you need a number of photons that's much larger than one so that the shock noise is relatively low. Uh, how many more photons than one you want, you need is determined by how much noise you can tolerate. But let's suppose you want, uh, let's suppose that maybe a, a thousand photons is enough because square root of a thousand is only around 30. And so you have noise of 30 versus signal of a thousand. Now, if you're insisting that you get a thousand photons at the detector, but you have a 10,000 dimensional vector, so you have 10,000 beams coming in, you will have less than one photon per spatial mode coming in on average, which means that there was less than one photon per average used for this individual scalar multiplications in the, uh, in the, in the SLM. And this is a fact that was pointed out in a couple of theory papers from a couple of years ago from uh, MIT and Princeton. And really the take home message of these is that you can achieve sub photon per multiplication energy efficiency, provided that the vector size N is large enough. If you make N big enough, you can really get to a regime where you use less than a single photon per scalar multiplication. Uh, and this is really the intuition I have for why this is true is that when you're doing matrix vector products, you are fundamentally doing a set of vector vector dot products and each vector vector dot product is summing over many scalar multiplications. And uh, if you sum over many things that are noisy, you can ultimately get something that's less noisy. Kind of freshman physics, propagation of error and summing to increase SNR uh, intuition there. So if you, if you could build such a low, in, low optical energy matrix vector multiply, what would it be good for? Well, uh, in this talk, may, may be no surprise that uh, this can be good for neural networks. Uh, and here's an example of a, of a three layer neural network. We have some input layer, a hidden layer and an output layer. Uh, and the layers are connected by matrix vector multiplications as I, I mentioned in the introduction. Neural networks are robust to noise. So particularly for inference where you can get away with eight or even four bits. And so there's a good match between doing inference and neural networks uh, and using op analog optical matrix vector multiplies. And a number of previous works have, uh, have shown this and that there's a very nice review that describes some of this going back to the 1980s. So in our case, we've done a, an experiment where we performed MNIST handwritten digit classification with uh, two hidden layers. Uh, so we're performing three matrix vector multiplications using our experimental optical matrix vector multiplier. Uh, and and it was something I should mention here is that optically what's happening is we're performing the matrix vector multiplications and then we're applying nonlinearity at each layer using a laptop. Uh, so the nonlinearity happens uh, kind of yeah, electronically outside of the optics. And the key result we have is plotting the accuracy of classifying handwritten digits as a function of how many photons we use per scalar multiplication. And we can see that when we use more than one photon per multiplication, we get high accuracy. And when we use uh, uh, way less than one photon per multiplication, we get uh, essentially almost random uh, outputs. But there's some really interesting regime over here, which is that at less than one photon per multiplication, so 0 0.644 photons per multiplication, we're still able to achieve 90% accuracy. So this is a demonstration of this thing that I gave you the intuition for a couple of slides ago that somehow you can really get away with uh, less than a photon per multi scalar multiplication and have it be sufficiently accurate that you can do machine learning with it. So now I'm gonna go on to describe what we can do with nonlinear optics. So I described in this, in this case, we were doing the nonlinear operation of the neural network in, uh, in electronics and you need nonlinearity in neural networks to give them depth and you need depth to get them to perform well. Uh, so in this example, I'm gonna tell you how we use nonlinear optics to achieve the nonlinearity so we didn't need to invoke a laptop. Uh, and we're gonna be using a frequency conversion process, but we're gonna do this in a pretty different way than the previous example. We're gonna do this more in the approximate or vaguely inspired intuition of how you can build uh, neural network accelerators out of photonics as I was describing in this uh, taxonomy of 
exact versus approximate equivalence earlier. This work was led by Logan Wright and Tatsuhiro Onodera, who are postdocs in my group, and they worked with Martin Stein, who's a PhD student. So the, the kind of problem we want to tackle is again performing inference in neural networks efficiently. And the intuition that we had in this project was uh, really thinking about something that is uh, Feynman-esque in the sense of Feynman motivated the development of quantum computing by saying uh, quantum systems are very difficult to simulate on classical computers. So why don't we turn the things around and use a quantum system to itself compute? Uh, and we can make the same kind of uh, argument for classical systems. There are many physical systems, including classical ones that are very expensive, both in energy and in time to simulate. Uh, and they, and this because they exhibit complex behavior and we can imagine turning this around. So an example of, of something that's difficult to simulate is for example, a, a wind tunnel. Uh, if I go to a wind tunnel and I put this car in it, if I want to simulate what will happen. Uh, I can solve the Navier-Stokes equations uh, on a GPU cluster, but it might take hours or days. Whereas if I just put this car in the wind tunnel and I turn the wind on one second later, I will have the pressure and velocity distribution. So there's some strong sense in which this is a setting where classical physics is, is doing something complex. that's difficult to simulate uh, that. Yeah. Even with modern digital computers is uh, would take a lot more energy and time. So we can ask again, can we turn the situation around and somehow use these difficult to simulate classical physical systems to perform computations that are expensive for us. And rather than trying to make this perform arbitrary computation for us, let's try limit ourselves to the, the challenge of, can we make an arbitrary physical system behave as a neural network that is somehow more energy efficient or faster than, uh, than what we could do otherwise. So this is the, the challenge. Oh. Sounds like a question. Okay, so how do we, how can we turn any physical system into a neural network? How can we do this? So what I've drawn at the, at the bottom here, this diagram at the bottom might look a little unfamiliar, but it's really a diagram of a neural network, just like the ones we've seen previously in this talk and that you've seen many times before of if we're going to do handwritten uh, digit classification, we will feed this into a neural network that is composed of multiple layers. And in the typical canonical multi-layer perceptron setting, each one of these gray boxes is going to be a layer of neurons that are connected to the next by a matrix vector multiplication. And so we just have a series of matrix vector multiplications uh, followed in each case by an element-wise nonlinearity. And the way things are drawn here, we have parameters feeding into the box as well as the data flowing through the neural network. And this is just uh, a way of representing that well, in the multi-layer perceptron case, there would be the weights of the weight matrix of the parameters. And so those are in some sense also an input to these, uh, these layers. So this is, you can think about this just as a redrawing of things you already know. But in our way of thinking about things, we say, well, there's no reason that these gray boxes have to be matrix vector multiplications followed by element-wise nonlinearities. There's a strong sense in which this is kind of a historical accident of the way neural, artificial neural networks were developed. And they're also clearly not the way the human brain works. So there's at least one sort of a counter example of it doesn't have to be matrix vector multiplications. You can imagine replacing each of these gray boxes with literally with a physical system where what you input to the physical system are your data and your parameters. And you let the physical system evolve for some time and then you read out some properties of the system and that's your output. And you can imagine cascading multiple physical systems, either the same ones or different ones. And this could be any physical system. It could be some optical system where it could be some nonlinear optical crystal, which is the example I'll focus on, but it could be anything else. It could be some mechanical system where you have some multimode mechanical oscillator. It could be some analog electronic system or some spintronic device, uh, it, anything at all. This is a, a general framework for thinking about how to turn physical systems into neural networks. So as an example of an optical one, here is something that, a diagram of something that we actually constructed in the lab. We made a, in this case, five layer neural network. 
where the task we wanted to perform was uh, vowel, spoken vowel recognition. So it wasn't uh, in this in this example shown on this slide, it wasn't MNIST handwritten digit classification, although we'll get to that. Um, where vowel, uh, spoken vowel recognition is you are given some uh, basically processed audio signal and are asked which vowel was the, the person saying? Was it, for example, ah is the, the case in this example. And the way that our, our neural network worked was the, the heart of it was a second harmonic generation crystal. Which really you can think about as performing a, a sum frequency generation process where it takes two photons, not necessarily of the same frequency and kind of combines them into one photon that has an energy that is the sum of the two photons that went in. This was the really the, the key uh, in this whole diagram, the key thing that's doing the work. But how do we how do we use this to do computing for us? How do we put the data and the parameters in and how do we read the output from this? That's what these preceding and um, following parts of the diagram are about. So the input and the parameters we encoded into the spectrum of a pulse laser. So we have a laser that is a TISAF laser that produces a pulse that has a spectrum that looks roughly like this between 770 and 775 nanometers. We put this through a pulse shaper, which is a standard configuration of gratings and a spatial light modulator that let us modulate the intensity of this pulse. Uh, and now once you pass the pulse shaper, you have your, your pulse that's been kind of shaped to encode input and parameters. And then this goes through the second harmonic generation crystal that produces a whole bunch of different colors uh, that are combinations of all these uh, uh, colors that were in the pulse. And we read it out on a spectrometer, which is again, just a grating and a camera. And so this is an example of something we might read out at about 300 nanometers or 380 nanometers because it's roughly uh, double the energy of, of these wavelengths here. And we can make a multi-layer neural network where we do this, we send the light through the setup multiple times. So we read out from the camera and then we feed it back into uh, the uh, the input in the, in, the, in the next stage. And in principle, we could make five copies of the setup, but in our case, we just had one copy of this optical setup that we sent the data through five times. But at each layer, we're sending in different sets of parameters, which changes the function that this SHG crystal is going to represent or, or make. And ultimately, we train the system so that it can recognize vowels. In this case, is the, the way we, we look at the readout of the final stage is by looking at the spectrum of the light that comes out and we say, okay, well, which spectral bin had the highest amplitude and that's what corresponds to the, the, the vowel that, was, uh, that, that is being classified. So in this case, the second bin corresponds to R. And so this, this would be the, the answer that you would read out from this. A natural question though you might have is how do you train this? How do you pick the parameters such that this thing implements the function you want to implement? And we needed a, a training procedure that's robust against, uh, against noise and it's effective at learning the parameters in a reasonable amount of time. And so the, the two key ideas for the way we do training is first of all, that we want to use gradient descent using backpropagation because this is the workhorse of modern machine learning. And we would like to leverage everything that people in the machine learning community have learned about how to train large models that are, that are good at performing this kind of task. But we can't naturally use backpropagation in a physical system. Uh, so what are we gonna do? And well, the, the thing that we settled on is to use a digital model of our physical system that is differentiable. And so we can do training using a digital model on a computer and then apply what we learn uh, from the computer when we're doing inference to the real physical system. And then the second key idea is that if you just use the first key idea, you will end up getting stuck because it will turn out that your digital model is not accurate enough uh, that you can take the parameters from it and just run on a physical system and have it work. So we use a, a procedure that we call physics aware training that's in basically paying homage to uh, quantization aware training, which is another method in, in the standard method of machine learning for dealing with this kind of problem of mismatch between uh, the training and the, and the inference hardware. And, but it also goes by the names by things like chip in the loop. And this is something we use to make the, the training robust to noise or imperfections in the model. So to 
put this in a diagram showing just a single layer example. If we have some physical system, the way we do training is we have a on a laptop, some model of what the physical system does. And this model will be differentiable so that we can use back propagation with it. And we will send through some example of data in the red and parameters in the orange. This will go through the physical system, it'll evolve, we'll read out, and then we can compute on a laptop what the difference between what the system output and what it should have been. Uh, because in training, we know what that difference is. We know what we're aiming for. It was an, we put in an eight, we know it was an eight. And in this case here, we can see, well, it got mostly that it was an eight, but there were a bunch of, it was incorrectly saying, well, it might've been all these other numbers. Uh, so we want to, we have an error that we have. We want to push all these other ones down and push this one up. So this is our error and we can send this through the differentiable digital model to compute the derivatives of the model with respect to all the tunable parameters in the standard machine learning back propagation way. Uh, we have this gradient that now tells us how to update our parameters and then you repeat this in a loop. And so the key thing is that you're doing the forward pass through the actual physical system and you're computing the gradients with the digital model. And because you use them in a loop, uh, they interact with one another in some sense, uh, the model can be imprecise or the physical system can be noisy and this whole thing still works. To show some example of this, for this uh, vowel classification task, this is now experimental data showing the accuracy you achieve as a function of the epoch, which is the number of, essentially the number of times the training has seen the training data set. You can see in the blue that if you use this physics aware training protocol, uh, you can get up to 93% uh, accuracy, which is a good accuracy for this task. But if you don't, if you only train with the model and they, on a laptop, and then you, at the end of it, just run it on inference on the hardware, you get no better than random guessing. And this is because you will go to weird parts of parameter space that do not correspond to reality if you only use a model. Uh, but the, the key is the blue points, is that if you do this procedure, you can actually get this to work in an experiment. And we've done this for not just optical setting. We've also done it with a mechanical setup, which is literally a piece of metal that we shake with an audio speaker, and we can get it to classify handwritten digits, uh, which is something that's maybe, at, I'll say a little bit surprising of you. How can you, how can a piece of metal that you shake implement a function that's actually useful for classifying handwritten digits? But it turns out that it, it has enough complexity in its dynamics that you can actually do this. Uh, we also did it with a very simple electronic oscillator, which was an RLC oscillator with one transistor added in. Uh, to provide nonlinearity, and this can also be made to work using the same procedure. And then finally, our nonlinear optical setup that I showed you two slides ago, uh, we also applied this to performing handwritten digit classification. Uh, and in this case, we can also get it to work. And uh, for this particular choice of architecture, uh, for this task, we're able to achieve 97% accuracy. And we think that there's a lot of interesting things what one could do with this type of procedure. You, we're not stuck to these three systems. We're not even saying that these ones are particularly good systems for performing machine learning, just that they were examples we could do in our first experiments. You can now imagine taking other different physical systems, both uh, things that are not optical, like spintronic systems, superconducting circuits, or things that are optics or hybrid optics semiconductors, like excitons in uh, 2D materials, and trying to harness their dynamics to, to perform machine learning. And we've provided our training code in a GitHub repo. So if anyone wants to try it out, they can just download it and try it. Uh, we're also happy to hear from people if anyone would like to uh, reach out to us that we're, yeah, we're, happy, to, we're happy to collaborate. In the final few minutes, I'm gonna quickly flash up an, a final example of a, a, a use of a neural network that tries to avoid a tricky thing that I haven't talked about much, but it's very important, which is the optics to electronic bottleneck. So this work was done by uh, Tianyu Wang and Mandar Sahoni and Logan Wright in that group. So the, what is this optics to electronics bottleneck? It's the following, uh, the following situation, is that if we have some uh, optical neural network, we somehow need to get data into it and we need to read data out of it. And typically, if you're gonna replace a GPU, you have some computer memory that's electronic that stores whatever data you're trying to classify or the pathway through the neural network, uh, intermediate activations. You need to take this electronic data and send it through a, a digital to analog converter and then send it to a transducer that converts it from analog electronics to optics. 
and then it goes through your optical system and then you you have your maybe a de detector array and then a, a bunch of analog to digital converters to send it back to electronic memory. And it turns out that these stages of uh, optics to electronics and electronics to optics conversion are very expensive, both in energy, but also in speed. They limit the, the rate at which you can send information into the system. So we'd like to try and get rid of these bottlenecks. And one option uh, to at least eliminate the first one is instead of sending in data into an optical neural network from an electronic memory, why don't you literally send an optical scene and then the data has started in optics in the first place. If you imagine like bolting an, opt an optical neural network on top of a self-driving car. You don't need to first have a camera record the image and then send it to a neural network. You can just have the scene literally kind of come in through a lens into the optical neural network. And this can at least get rid of the first bottleneck. And why would you want to try to do this? Well, one strong reason for doing this is image sensing, where let's say you want to classify traffic signs. The conventional way to do this would be you have some imaging optics, you have some large megapixel camera that images it, produces gigabyte images, and then you have some GPU sitting in your car that processes this data and produces some very small amount of data out, like what is the uh, what, what is the sign saying? What is its location? Where is it on a map, et cetera? But it's typically really, really small uh, amount of information you're trying to extract, and yet you were capturing a huge amount of information to do that. So this sampled signal data that was sampled on a camera is way larger than the embedded information. And this naturally leads one to think, well, what happens if you replace this system with an optical neural network that directly can capture the information from the scene that you want? Uh, so we've constructed an experiment with a multi-layer neural network where we were able to do with uh, 3D printed very toy examples of what a self-driving car might see. Uh, and traffic sign recognition where we can send through a couple of layers of a neural network down to just four pixels on a camera. So instead of capturing a megapixel image or uh, sort of thousands of pixel image, you can capture just four pixels. And it's the system, the neural network has encoded the information in there in such a way that you can then uh, accurately recover that the speed limit sign was a 50, for example, uh, in a digital backend. So this is something that probably you don't want to fit on top of a self-driving car yet. This is about a meter or two meters long, but uh, it's a proof of concept that this can work. And uh, a key uh, enabler for us to make a multi-layer neural network is that we were using an image intensifier to provide the optical nonlinearity or optoelectronic nonlinearity. And as an example of some results of looking at traffic signs and 3D scenes, they were illuminated with incoherent light. We can achieve an accuracy of 72% to identify the sign. And this is as opposed to a single layer linear neural network, which will only achieve 61%. So with that, I'll flash up the summary. I've shown you three examples of different ways you can build optical neural networks using linear and nonlinear optics, as well as how you can try to process optical data that you can eliminate at least one of the electronics to optical bottlenecks that, that come up. Uh, so with that, thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions that anyone might have. Yeah, th thank you very much for this really nice talk. I suggest if you have a question that would come up here and speak into this. Bye. Hi, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, I have a question about the physics aware training. Mm -hmm. um, so two questions, kind of. So you would say it's quite possible to implement it for any physical system, but how would you use how many layers of the physical system you would use? How did you decide whether you use like three or six? Sure. Uh, so. I I guess I'll, give the, I'll use this opportunity to give some caveats to the, like, we can do it with any physical system. And then I'll also explain how we choose the number of layers. Um, so the, first of all, the caveat is, I can't promise you that with any physical system, it will be a good neural network. We can turn it into a neural network, but it, not, it might not be very good. It depends on what the task is that you're trying to do. Just as different neural network architectures can be better or worse at different tasks, different physical systems implement different classes of functions that may be better or worse at doing different tasks. Another key thing is that that's implicit in all this is that if you train a physical system to perform some machine learning task, it needs to have the 
the repeatable dynamics that uh, once you've tra once you've learned what parameters you should feed it, that it behaves the same way roughly each time. Uh, if it keeps totally changing the way it behaves, then it won't be a very effective neural network. Um, how do we pick the number of layers? That we basically pick the number of layers based on how many we need to get good performance, which is very much in the same sort of way that a conventional neural network person might do things of, well, you don't want, you ideally would like your neural network to be as small as possible, but not smaller. Um, and so the, in our paper where we pick different numbers of layers, it's basically how many layers did we need to get some reasonable performance on some tasks. Uh, another subtlety that I'll use this opportunity to mention is that if you have physical systems implementing different layers, there's a natural question you can wonder of how do you connect the first layer to the second layer's physical system if you don't do it sort of in time with a laptop in between like we did in our demonstrations. And I think this is a major uh, kind of open question slash outstanding challenge for trying to design physical neural networks with, that are multi-layer, that you want the physical systems to, uh, to be able to send data directly to each other without in involving a big, uh, well, certainly not, not with involving a laptop, but preferably not even involving um, going to electronics and back. Uh, and so that's something that, that that needs work because in the nonlinear optics case, for example, you you send in 700 and something nanometer light, you get 300 and something nanometer light out, and then the next stage you want to send 700 something nanometer light in again. And so uh, we do that. We deal with this by putting a laptop in between, but that's not really the ultimate thing you want. You would like something that can just sort of flow through. And maybe a solution to this in a nonlinear optics case is not to do something. Uh, like some frequency generation, but maybe some other four-wave mixing process where the frequencies that you start and end with are more similar. So that was a bit of a grab bag, but I don't know if that was helpful. No, that was helpful. That kind of relates to my other question. So we're always saying that the motivation is that the using a physical system for the machine learning will reduce the energy consumption, but these systems seem very complex. Do you think they actually are energy efficient or they could be and yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, great Did question. you consider that? <laughs> sure. So in, uh, these, in these two works here, uh, the, the top two, we are not in a situation where we're beating a GPU yet. These are both papers where kind of the, they're framed in the sense of you, we're making physical systems that can implement neural networks uh, just like a GPU can, but in neither case are we anywhere near the energy efficiency or speed of a GPU. Uh, and the, but the reason that we are working on it is that we believe that it, it can be. Uh, the intuition for maybe how can it be is, well, if a GPU is able to do uh, 1 million scalar multiplications per nanosecond, if we imagine making a, uh, a, a, an optical neural network that let's say has a 10 or 100 million pixels on a spatial light modulator and you feed that data in at a, gig, at a gigahertz data rate, then it will, uh, well, it'll be have a higher throughput than the GPU, but also because these individual multiplications uh, cost almost no energy, uh, you, you only need to count the energy of generating the light and doing the transduction on either side. Uh, we, we have a paper that's not on the archive yet, but will we'll be soon where we go through this in, uh, in quite some detail for the case of transformer models. Uh, and our conclusion from this is if that if you make the system big enough, you will be able to get uh, an energy efficiency and a speed advantage over GPUs. But to our knowledge, no one has managed to beat an H100 yet. It's a, it's a really tough bar, but yeah, we work on this because we believe it's possible. Okay. Thank you. Sure, thank you for the questions. Okay. <laughs> Hello, Professor Peter. Uh, what were the challenges for training the SLMs? and how the, this optical nonlinear activation looks like. Thank you. Sure. So for both example three and example one, we were training uh, the weight matrices that were implemented on spatial light modulators. And the major, well, one of the major challenges there was to make the optical alignment good enough so that when you train uh, a model on a laptop that when you actually run it on the physical system, the physical system is doing something very close to what uh, what you would, uh, the mathematics that you're putting into the training algorithm in the laptop. Uh, and this is something where uh, the, the alignment is, 
in my opinion, relatively tricky because uh, Tianyu has managed to managed to do pixel to pixel alignment of five over five hundred thousand pixels from a phone screen to five hundred thousand pixels on the SLM and get them kind of aligned well enough that you, you're getting about eight bits of precision. Um, but once you've done the alignment well, then uh, then the training becomes relatively easy because it, you've literally made the physical system do the thing that the laptop is doing. Um, as for the nonlinear activation function, in the, in the, in the top case here, we're using a, a laptop to implement a standard, probably a ReLU or a sigmoid activation function. In the case of the bottom example here, where we're doing the, the nonlinearity using an image intensifier, there's basically a, like a saturation effect that happens in an image intensifier. The image intensifier you're using, a, like the kind of device that appears in night vision goggles. And so as you increase the, the power into it, you, the, the, the power out you get slowly starts to flatten off and it looks a little bit like a sigmoid function. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I've uh, seen you mentioned that it's suitable for like image sensing application. So the, I mean, the optical neural networks. And I want to ask if you have tested this optical neural networks with other types of application. And do you see any features that we can adapt this type of ne neural network? to other like, application or other areas? Thank you. Sure, that's a, that's a great question. So image sensing, of course, is not only relevant to, for example, self-driving cars or even real scenes in general, um, but you can also imagine other situations in which the, the data comes in optically. Something that we've tested uh, in a sort of simulation setting, but it's not simulation like a laptop, but uh, instead of 3D printing a scene, we put a, a, a DMD device that we project up an image of uh, fluorescent images of cells from a flow cytometry experiment and show that we can classify the different types of cells. Uh, and this is something that could be useful because in flow cytometry, my understanding is that the speed at which they can sort cells is limited by how quickly they can classify them uh, and the feedback loop that's involved. So an optical neural network that is able to process these uh, these cell or process the images of the cells very quickly could actually be useful there. Um, we also did it with some more artificial data sets like the Google QuickDraw data set. And so there's some generality to what even this two layer neural network is able to do. I think another uh, really interesting application of optical neural networks to optical data, another place where optical data naturally comes up besides fluorescent images or real scene images is in optical communications. And there've been several uh, papers that have been published already on imagining directly processing the data that comes out of an optical fiber. Uh, and I think that that seems like a really natural place to, to look to try and, uh, and get a benefit because again, it's the, the data is already in optics and so now you don't have to pay the electronics to optics cost. Thank you. I don't see any further questions. So in the interest of time, I would just that we thank Peter again for the great talk. Great, thanks very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the school. Thank you. Thank you. And then we come to the last talk of today's afternoon session, which will be given by Laurent. We need to change anything about them. That's what I'm trying to. Yes. Okay, and then we get the industry skills of optical neural networks and we'll learn how to build exascale AI systems again. So, Bruce, is your. So uh, thank you, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, but you give me a hard task because I'm the, the last speaker of a very busy day. <laughs> uh, just there's only me between uh, 
the previous talk on the cocktail party. <laughs> <laughs> now it will be some break, so... Yeah. <laughs> uh, and also the previous talk was, uh, was very exciting and very great, so uh, uh, I'm trying to make something without too many equations, so that uh, to keep you uh, awake. Uh, and uh, also another disclaimer, uh, okay, this could be about machine learning photonics, but myself, I know nothing about machine learning, and I know nothing about photonics, I'm just a fraud here. Uh, actually, my field of research is signal processing for acoustics. I used to do, to do that for some time, uh, but I just happened to have uh, excellent uh, colleagues uh, such as uh, Sylvain uh, for the optical side and uh, Florent for the machine learning side. And uh, so, well, we are light on, we are started with uh, about 25 in the center of Paris. We are a spin off from university research. Uh, yeah, and you're welcome to visit anytime you are here in Paris. And actually, I will start with, uh, uh, with sort of the product side, uh, what we do in terms of product, and then I will come to the, to the science. And there's this new AI, and maybe some of you have heard of uh, what they call foundation models. So these uh, foundation models, they, like it was called by uh, the computer science department at Stanford University, they say, yeah, we have to, to all uh, uh, investigate these foundation models. So they're called foundation models because it's a single model that does plenty of tasks. It's not trained for a specific use case, it's a model. And then you ask it to, to do its different things. So for instance, uh, you have these language models. Uh, you, for instance, here you, you ask it to write uh, an email to a salesman uh, at a lathe for a laser company, and I guess some of you have already <laughs> written such emails, and uh, you click on generate, uh, and the model would generate the text, like, uh, like this one. And uh, dear Tom, and so on, it makes a perfect email. Of course, it, it has to invent the way you, you intend to, to use the laser for, and if you're not happy, you can always edit the thing, but uh, it's like, well, uh, uh, you, you can do the same model, you can do different things. You say, no, okay, this is, I want an Instagram ad, for this uh, for this resort in uh, in the Philippines, uh, but oh, okay, I'm the owner of the hotel, I'm the manager of the hotel, and please insist on the fact that it's luxurious, uh, luxury on the diving because I, uh, the diving is uh, stunning in the, in this uh, Philippine place. So you click on generate, and then Bing, it makes an <laughs> Instagram ad uh, like everything you, you you would see typically on Instagram, and you can see that it has a understood that you want to, to have uh, this luxurious type of thing, uh, luxurious private villa and the diving and so on. So it, has a, it understands what we say in terms of... In terms of uh, Did you try research papers or...? That would be very useful. Exactly, exactly. Maybe for nature, maybe for... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And... Uh, <laughs> market. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but the subscription will be very expensive. <laughs> uh, so we make it all in different languages. We make it in French, like uh, here you, there is for those who understand French, this is a stupid like a, a newspaper about a real estate in Paris in, from Le Figaro, like a typical business uh, newspaper. And you, so you write the first part of the article and you, you ask it to continue and it continues in the same side, same content. It events like it, it's interesting because in the first part it quotes some experts. So the second part, it, 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 the program invents some experts. There is no person called uh, uh, Eric Lejean at uh, AXA Real Estate, but uh, it invents some experts and it, it quotes some fake experts. <laughs> so in the same side, so it can do other things like uh, text summarization. For instance, here we we had a small uh, plugin for. Uh, uh, you, you put the HTML address of, a, of an article from Le Monde, and it makes a one-line summary that's uh, equally good as the, the one-line summary you, you get uh, below the title. So it's, uh, this is just an example. So this is just this new generation of um, language models. So some of you have heard the first one was really GPT-3. GPT-3, uh, I guess most of you have heard of GPT-3 from OpenAI. This is this new language model. Uh, the equivalent of which I just demonstrated. This is this, and it's going to really different office work, uh, like uh, make, uh, help you to be more efficient in your everyday, everyday life. 
but there are the equivalent of uh, same type of architecture to to help you do code programming. Like uh, codex is something like you start typing uh, uh, so, some code and it's like autocomplete. You start uh, writing a routine and it, it proposes you the end of the routine. And so our engineers they use it routinely now uh, in at Lightham, they use it to, to program faster. It's not perfect, but it, it saves you time. Uh, drug discovery as well, uh, AlphaFold, you may have heard that, this program that uh, predicts the, the 3D structure of, the, of some proteins, uh, etc. Oh, there is all this new excitement about this image generation now as well, like DAL E uh, type of thing. Uh, or stable diffusion, this new model for image generation. This is this new class of uh, uh, what's called yeah foundation model, or they are based on transformers. Transformers. This is the new architecture that is behind that. I will come back to that uh, to that later. Uh, so yeah, it's interesting as well. Also, the time scale. The first paper of transformers came in 2017, I think, from from Google. So five years ago only. Although it's already like. It, the, the, transition, the transition time from the first paper from, from Google to the actual product is, is really fast. I don't think we have seen that uh, very often in the, in the industry. So it's interesting because this new generation has never been so hard to build in terms of uh, you need a massive amount of uh, training, uh, training data. Like for the language model, we call it civilization scale because if I ask my engineers, uh, do you take more like uh, the books, the articles, uh, the web crawling, they say, I'll take everything. Uh, give me as much, as much data as you can, and I'm going to train on that. And it's like, a, if you divide uh, uh, by the average length of a book, our models, we train them on like 2 million books. Uh, uh, there's some web crawling also on that, that books, article, everything, you, you name it, we take everything. Of course, we filter because we don't want to have like web crawling, uh, without any content filtering, because otherwise you get everything that's bad, in, of course, in the discussion. But uh, anyway, there is a lot of also software, very hot topic, uh, how to design software to train these models, because it's extremely challenging. Also hardware. I mean, it really pushes the limits of hardware. I'm going to, I mean, this is the main topic of my talk. Uh, this really drives even new chip architecture. That, uh, H100 chip that was uh, shown by uh, Peter in the last talk. This is re has been designed to train that. This is the main application, number one, to train this language model. I mean, this uh, very large scale model. But uh, on the other hand, you, this complexity of um, building this model turns into, uh, it's very easy to use. Uh, it's like a, just an API. Uh, uh, it's a generic model, as I said, foundation model, a single generic model perform multiple, multiple tasks, including some it has not been explicitly trained for, uh, like uh, it's not a model to do an Instagram, uh, Instagram ad. We, we never trained explicitly for Instagram ad, but it has seen so many in the training that it understood that it's a new category of things. But it's, a, it's really a self-supervised. So we, we never said this is Instagram ad, and we, we give them a, 200,000 Instagram ads, and we, it just saw so many that it uh, sets the uh, Natural language, you interact with the machine like with a colleague. Please make an Instagram ad. Uh, and also, uh, yeah, it's also important to train them in different languages. But OK, let, let me skip that. So again, I, I, the key ingredient in that is this new architecture that's called transformers. So it's beyond the, the like, it, it, it's also a category of deep neural network, uh, but it's beyond the convolutional neural network that you may have seen, uh, the, the neural network that you've learned. Uh, uh, so transformers, uh, okay, this is not, uh, <laughs> if you have kids, you know what transformers are, <laughs> but this is not, this is not this. This is much uglier, this is this. Uh, so this is the arch this architecture. So, okay, you can skip the detail. When, the important feature is what's called the attention. So attention in, in transformers is this, this box here. So attention, why, why it's important is that it's a three, you have three entries, right? You see there are three arrows that go in attention. So uh, the attention, what makes it more efficient, more powerful than the standard uh, 
uh, in standard neural network, I would say you, you take two objects and you say, are they similar or are they dissimilar? It's a two by two type of uh, correlation. I want to classify uh, uh, dogs from cats, uh, features of dogs from features of cats, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Here, it's a three type of thing. So it's, it's like correlation with context. And what makes it, that, that's what makes it very powerful. For instance, in language, if I can take the language, uh, uh, I bought bread at the market, and it was, and it was very hot. Of course, it's, if you say hot, the, 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 what it refers to, it, it's very likely here that, uh, that it's the brain, right? Uh, because it's, uh, you know, that the bread, uh, bread and hot, it, 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 it's great. You, you, you buy uh, bread from the market, and you're very excited to smell it. Very good. So, bread and hot. But if you say it was very busy, the it refers to the market, right? So it's, uh, it, it, it's why you have this three item, three brings in context. That's, that's the thing in uh, attention in, in the transformers. How oh, it is quantified mathematically? Can you just please. So it's, it's like you have two, two objects, and then you have a nonlinearity, and then the third one comes in. So it's. Uh, can, can I add just, uh, just because it's a, can I add something on this? Uh, the, the, good, the good stuff about the attention is that differently from what we just saw previously of this layer where we have multiplication and those rings are just constant after you train you don't you don't change anymore in attention this multiplication this matrix multiplication now the coefficients change depending on the input so the the matrix multiplication is not between a constant but a function Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's a very good, uh, very good point. And, and why is three? Why not four? Well, it's already. I mean, imagine the already the complexity explodes, right? Uh, if you already have to train with three, of course, uh, it's it's likely that with four you would get better results. But it's, I guess it's all a matter of complexity. Uh, already the performance jump from two to three it's it's uh, incredible. I mean, that's what makes this language model so efficient that they understand the, the context. So what we do uh, in the company for these language models, we are, uh, so we, if you go on our web page, you know, we present ourselves as, a, uh, as, a, as an AI company. Uh, so we build this language model in different languages, in the French, Italian, Spanish, German, English, and then we also have a modern standard Arabic uh, very soon uh, in the, uh, on, in, on the platform as well, uh, you can play with it. I mean, the subscription, there's a zero euro subscription, so it's a premium model. You can you can play with it with a few credits, and uh, if if you want more, uh, uh, you pay or, or you ask me for more credit, and I, I give you some. Um, okay, but then okay, the hidden ingredient is of course the amount of compute. This is just an insane amount of compute that you need for this model. Just to train this model, and then I, I can talk about inference as well, but just to train the model, this is just insane. And now we are entering the era of AI at the side of a supercomputer. Like uh, this uh, GPT-3 model, when it was released by OpenAI two years ago, uh, they had a partnership with Microsoft to build a branch of uh, Microsoft Azure. Uh, that was at that time, this specific branch was at that time number five supercomputer in the world. Uh, just designed for OpenAI. So it's uh, the numbers of uh, staggering. You need uh, 3 million GPU hours. So it's like uh, 10,000 GPUs for a few weeks just to train a single model. Uh, of course, the carbon footprint um, it has been very controversial because they, I mean, uh, we have to take care of, uh, of the planet. Of course, do we need such models? Okay, I'm not going to go into this uh, discussion. We can, we can have it, of course. 
And also the price. I mean, the price is uh, just to train a single model, uh, 10,000 GPU hours uh, is like uh, millions of dollars just to train a single model. Um, the thing is, it's only the beginning. Then in the beginning, GPD-3 was uh, two, years, uh, two years old. It has 175 billion parameters. Nowadays, there are models with trillion parameters. It's, uh, it's mad. I, OK. Uh, the gap between, I would say, uh, the, the supply and demand, I would say, or uh, the, the demand for compute on uh, any type of more slow on the chip. Of course, the chip price is amazing. Uh, NVIDIA keeps doing uh, fantastic chips. But it's nowhere near the, the speed at which the number of parameters increase. And if you double the number of parameters, fundamentally you have to double how much training data you need. So you actually quadruple the computation needs. And it, at some point it was the, uh, in this language model. I think it's not, not as fast now, but at, work, at some point it was doubling every three months the size of this. Uh, language model, so it's completely, completely crazy. But why, why do we always go bigger? I mean, we, when we, for some of you who have taken some machine learning classes, you, you, you were probably be told that uh, you had decreasing, decreasing returns. Like, uh, okay, if I have some, uh, uh, some training data, and then I, I have a bit more training data, I will get a few more percent, but it's, like decreasing returns type of load. But this was uh, the, like the deep, in the very old age of deep learning, like already 10 years ago. But nowadays, with this model, people have realized that actually, with larger model, you get better performance. And you can, you can actually predict the type of performance that you have. There's this very nice paper called uh, Scaling Laws in Language Models. Uh, and actually, it gets so large that uh, with, with these models, you, um, yeah. Let, let, let me spend a couple of minutes on this on this graph. On the x-axis, you've got uh, how much compute you have. What what supercomputer do you have? Do you have like a, a top one supercomputer uh, like uh, there is in the US or China, or do you have just just a small supercomputer or just a computer of your university or just your GPU uh, uh, at home? So this is the compute you have on the x-axis, or in a log scale, of course. On the y-axis, it's the performance of the model. And the different colors is how many parameters you have in your model. So dark blue, uh, this purple thing, it's a small model. And the, the yellow, it's a big model with trillions of parameters. So what you see here, it's very interesting, is that for a given compute budget, say I'm um, here at the compute budget, I should go to a, it's better to have a large, mo a large model that's a bit under trained than a small model that's trained to convergence. So this is something that people have known. I mean, it was known from, for practitioners, but no, you, you can put numbers on that. And it scales very well. I mean, uh, there, is, there are these scaling laws with some weird coefficients. They, they are just, the coefficients are just empirical. Huh? It's not, uh, there is no, as far as I know, there is no proof on why this should be like uh, this weird uh, 0 0.048 uh, scaling laws, but at least it holds over several orders of magnitude. So it's great because you can predict, you can make small scale experiments and predict what will be the performance if I have a supercomputer. So you can make it with your GPU at home, almost. Uh, at small scale, it's, it starts to be dependent on the architecture. But at a large scale, you can do it with a small scale experiment and predict what would be the performance if you had a supercomputer, the top one supercomputer in the world. And this, this sharp drop in the game, where, where does that come from? Oh, well, okay. I have to say as well that it's, uh, it's the validation loss. This is one measure of performance that. Uh, of course, it's only one answer, and it's a, but there's a disclaimer here in the, the performance as measured by the validation loss. But uh, yes, there, there is some really, uh, there's a big difference between, uh, between here and here in terms of uh, performance. I mean, this is a, yeah. So, uh, at the bottom line, 
larger model they score higher, uh, very generally. They generalize better, and they, they train faster in, in, in the sense that uh, there is a faster decrease uh, uh, with uh, some sort of compute. So it's better to train a larger model. Uh, um, but of course, you need more data. Uh, again, uh, it's provided you have sufficient training data, uh, which is which may be a problem. Uh, like if I want to to train a uh, at some point, we, we looked in the company whether we would be able to train language model in all the official European languages, but no way, uh, like there are some languages like, uh, I don't know, Gaelic uh, in Ireland, it's an official European language uh, recognized by the EU, but no way there is that much written uh, stuff that you can train a large language model uh, on that. So data uh, may be a limitation, of course. So all, all of this, uh, I think it's uh, there is this big, re, uh, this big renewal of uh, specialized AI, AI chip uh, to uh, uh, either training or inference, uh, as it was discussed. But at least uh, when we started the company uh, six years ago, people say, oh, you're crazy, everyone is happy. All the compute is in the cloud. It's a commodity now. And, uh, and the CPU and GPU, why would you do something else? And uh, of course, no, there is more than 100 projects. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, in, in chips, uh, many startups, uh, large companies, even the top 10 companies in the world, I think eight out of 10, they all have their own uh, AI chip uh, project internally. So maybe, uh, uh, yeah, it's, so it's, it's like a, all the big companies have their own AI chip and uh, there's more than that. So we call it the Cambrian explosion. Uh, of course, most of them are on uh, silicon, but uh, we believe we, uh, optics or photonics may have an edge, and I think the, the previous talk was very interesting, and I think we share a lot of uh, uh, the philosophy on how to build a chip with uh, you, you have to be very careful because uh, uh, um, you, are, as, as uh, Peter was saying, you, you are competing with, uh, with NVIDIA, huh? so uh, competing with NVIDIA is a big challenge. It's a, bit, uh, it's a crazy... With the resources. Yeah, well, <laughs> they only may have uh, like uh, uh, two, I think every generation costs them two, two billion dollars just in research and development uh, for each new generation of chips. So, uh, so, so it, it all started with a uh, with discussion with, uh, that was uh, an experiment in Sylvain's lab uh, like uh, six years ago when we started the company. Uh, it was using light scattering to do some, uh, some useful mathematical operation. Uh, so there is uh, so the principle is it, it's extremely simple. Uh, so it's uh, uh, leveraging scattering, uh, uh, multiple scattering. So you have a laser, coherent light, uh, uh, a slab of uh, scattering material, and then you you got this uh, speckle. Or the speckle is just a result of interference, of course, of this uh, of this light. But uh, instead of having uh, uh, an homogeneous beam you modulate spatially with, a, with an SLM or a DMD or whatever your favorite uh, light modulator device at the input. So this is how you input information. And then you have a CMOS camera at the output. And uh, if you manage well, uh, you, you get uh, uh, uncorrelated pixel at the input and the output. Uh, so there is a bit of optics involved here, uh, but you, you can get uncorrelated in uh, pixel, but what's interesting is that the physics itself is linear. So, uh, uh, like what uh, what was discussed uh, uh, with with, uh, with Silva is that there must be a transmission matrix. That's here it's it's random, and not only it's random, it's uh, its coefficients are Gaussian IID. So you can guarantee the distribution of the coefficients uh, due to due to physics, and of course you. You, you, there is this, uh, because you measure the intensity, there is this uh, element-wise nonlinearity that you apply uh, uh, at the output. But what's interesting is that it's, uh, the, it's the size, huh? because uh, light modulator, you can have uh, typically, I mean, you can buy off-the-shelf light modulator with millions of pixels. Uh, CMOS sensor, you can buy off-the-shelf uh, CMOS sensor for, for your smartphone uh, with uh, uh, 40 million pixels. Uh, and so this is million by million. So it's like having a, a transmission matrix of size million rows by million million columns. Uh, that's the size that makes it uh, uh, 
uh, quite attractive for this type of, uh, uh, it's not really the speed, it's really the size. Huh? Uh, well, the speed is relatively slow, it's at the kilohertz. Uh, you run this thing at the, at the kilohertz, but the, the size is really huge. Uh, so it, it's the equivalent, it's a non finite man because it's, these coefficients are fixed by design. You cannot change, you cannot program the coefficients. So you, you make a multiplication by a random matrix fixed, you can guarantee the distribution, but it's fixed, right? Uh, it's fixed by design, but by letting go of the programmability, in return, you get extremely high number of uh, operations per watt. So it's, uh, it's a trade-off. In some cases, uh, what we have demonstrated in the last few years is that there are cases where, of course, it's not a fully optical uh, computer, it's just one computing block. Yeah. But this computing block can be useful, can help you overall reduce the, uh, the speed and, uh, and, uh, and energy consumption of the whole uh, training job, for instance, uh, because, of the, because of the science. So we, uh, we took the, the experiment uh, from Silmas Lab, we went to all the stages to, to, to prototype, and now it's, it's, actually, uh, it's actually a product, uh, we, we actually sell it. And it's, uh, it has a, yeah, a performance of, uh, uh, well, similar performance in terms of, uh, we are in the beta ops type of regime uh, for 30 watts. So in terms of the number of operations per watt, it's, it's, uh, it was 200 times better. When I did this, uh, this computation, it was a couple of months ago before we had the specification of the H100. So it's, I think it's less than that now, but it's still, it's still much better probably just, just one order of magnitude instead of two, and the H100 is still better. Uh, better than NVIDIA, but of course it's not a one-to-one -one replacement because you have no programmability. Uh, so I insist on that. It, it's not a bug, it's a feature, right? Uh, but uh, it's not a one-to-one -one replacement with GPU. It's non uh, and in the Over the last few years, we've been given that to uh, uh, friends, uh, all the a network of uh, researchers. Uh, uh, please uh, play, play with that and uh, build uh, interesting uh, use cases uh, of this type of computations. We had, uh, for instance, uh, deep neural network. We had David Rousseau here doing. Uh, he is doing. He's working with the CERN data. Uh, he has to classify events from this uh, big uh, particle accelerator. And uh, of course, they have lots of lots of lots of data. So. Like the amount of data for them is really, really a big challenge. Uh, so we've been trying to use this uh, to, to classify events. We've done some reinforcement learning. Uh, uh, we always, I mean, if you see in the diagram, it's a simplified diagram. The, the optical part, the photonic part, is only one part of the computation, right? And this is where there is a light on logo. But the other thing is made on the CPU or GPU. Right? It is like hybrid computing. Uh, we are not replacing it with replacing everything, we are just doing some computation using LAN. Uh, okay, adversarial robustness and differential privacy, I will come back to that uh, afterwards. This is the latest uh, studies we made uh, more in link with the industry needs. That's interesting because, uh, well, okay, I'll come back to that later. Uh, reservoir computing, this was mentioned earlier during the day, we can do reservoir computing because it, this is really typically uh, from one, one time step to the other, this is one big random matrix multiplication fixed. So this is perfect to do this type of uh, architecture. So the feedback loop is, uh, is made electronically here. So again, a great uh, radar of computing, uh, sketching for change point detection and so on. So we have lots of uh, applications and uh, I, can, I can give you uh, pointers if you are interested in any of these. Okay, there is some, okay, you know benchmark, it's always a bit of uh, cherry picking. So this is my cherry picking. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, and again, we, we are not comparing GPU versus lighted uh, optical processing unit. We are comparing GPU only versus GPU plus uh, lighted uh, light optical processing unit. So this is the accelerator of the accelerator. If you if you see that, right? And so, and by using that, we can reduce uh, some some classification tasks by a factor from one to twenty. Uh, with a significant energy uh, reduction as well. And uh, again, uh, this is our benchmark. Uh, but at least we, we show that in some cases we can be, 
uh, really competitive. Uh, I'm not saying that any, anywhere I will, it's, how much you will gain is, of course, very much algorithm dependent, case dependent, on mostly dimension dependent. If you work in small dimension problems, no way this is an interesting approach. Because we, with this type of uh, free space uh, thing, what you really need is to leverage the dimensionality, one million by one million. Uh, it, so if you have a small scale, uh, small dimension, keep your CPU, keep your GPU, you're happy with that. But then if you go to very high dimension, 10,000, 100,000, up to one million, this is where uh, it's essentially the computation with the optics, more or less, they are, the speed is independent on the dimension of the problem. So uh, it's order one uh, on the project, and so, yeah. So can you elaborate here? So in what format your data should be prepared, or data okay, so for your it's, it's a vector. It's in, a vector. So input vector, output vector. Uh, and, and so conversion to this special format, it's uh, something which is done. So, so basically, we, we are working in optical communication, right? Okay. So a signal is in time domain. Uh, input, you've got a vector of x. The output, uh, it's uh, y equals m m x. So we can prepare as long as you want vector in time domain. So, but uh, is any sort of device which can work it or, or, or you need special uh, well, you so you it depends what you want to do but we did we did some studies for instance for for time series uh, uh, using uh, using this device it's time series in very high dimension so here for instance it was in molecular dynamics so you we wanted to study the dynamics of uh, uh, numerical simulation of this uh, COVID type of protein. Uh, so there are 700,000 uh, atoms in this uh, protein and they move in 3D space uh, for every step of the simulation. So we are actually in dimension 2 million, 2.1 million. Uh, so we want to detect uh, so change point. The dimension is not an issue because we can take, I don't know, thousand spectral channels and yeah. have uh, time and uh, temporal signal, so it will be huge dimension. Uh, but I, I, I'm talking about format, in which format you can uh, the, take data. Uh, the, the format is always like that. But it's a DMT. Can you see it? So it's we need like to convert time to yeah, yeah. DMT. Yeah. So we, we, we should make it but lower. Uh, okay, I understand. Okay, physically, of course, it's, it's a 2D array. The DMT is a 2D array, but because the pixels are independent okay. from each other, you can really, you should consider that as a vector. That's because of the independence of the pixel. And, and, and you said kilohertz. Yes, yeah, kilohertz, yes, yes. Uh, uh, a few, few kilohertz. Yeah. Like the ma matrix is always the same. The matrix is always the same, yes. And we've, we've guaranteed the stability of our widths. Uh, of course, it, need, it needs a bit of a control. Uh, mm -hmm. Thermal control, etc., and that's our secret uh, secret sauce. Uh, but, uh, but but yes, it, it's stable. Yes. Maybe not about yours. Uh, if you if you check the device and if you do uh, like a temperature variation, extreme temperature variation, uh, but it's good for the data center. Huh? If you put it in a data center, you can train a model and uh, use it uh, a couple of months later, and it will, it will still work. And where is the Learning then, so if you wanted to use yeah, yeah, so the learning is is in all the other arrows, like uh, the learning is here, 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 everywhere else. You can adapt. You don't have to adapt to train all layers. That's our point in your network. There are some layers that you can uh, you, you can uh, you can say that can stay fixed. Uh, I have a question. How did you um, decide the structure of the matrix? Since it's fixed, did you? to a specific structure or is it random or? Uh, so, no, g given, the, given the physics of the light scattering, uh, it, it, it imposes that the, the structure uh, it will be distributed with a random distribution with Gaussian entries. So that's it. You, you've got a, the physics guarantee you that it's a Gaussian distribution, Gaussian IID. Uh, and uh, that's it, we don't, uh, but actually it's a good distribution. It's a good distribution for what we want to do. So it, uh, it's maximally mixing if you, if you see it in, 
in terms of information theory. So uh, usually that's what people do. If, if they don't have any uh, prior knowledge on the data, that there's this whole theory called compressive sensing and so on that have shown that uh, uh, random matrices with Gaussian entries are a, a universal mix of information. So I'm not saying it's the optimal, I'm saying it, it works. So um, this is one example that's interesting that, that was done recently with, uh, well, I think they, I don't know if they, they are still called Facebook yeah, research, maybe it's Meta yeah, research now, but uh, they are a, a research group in, in Paris with uh, Laurent Meunier, and they collaborated with us in improving the robustness uh, of this. And it's interesting because in this case, uh, the fact that we are analog uh, and the fact that uh, it has noise, and I mean it is low precision, uh, brings additional benefits. It's not something that you want to fight. It's something that you can use to actually improve the robustness of your neural network here to the to adversarial attacks. So an adversarial attack of a neural network is some people, uh, some malignant uh, person, uh, putting some noise in the training in the training data to misclassify. Uh, that you, uh, so you put some noise that was carefully designed. You design some noise that's not perceptible, but that will, on purpose, uh, make a misclassification. So of course, people at uh, Facebook, they are meta, uh, they, they are very scared of that, huh? because it's, uh, uh, if the system is self-trained, uh, there could be some malignant people uh, trying to fool their, their, uh, their learning algorithm, their recommender system, or, 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 or the, the AI system that, uh, that they, are, they are based on. I mean, this is just an AI company, huh? if you think of uh, Meta. Uh, um, um, so what we do is here, you do the standard neural network, uh, and you put the, the optical processing unit uh, just at, at the last stage, just, uh, I mean, you, the standard method, you would remove the optical unit, uh, you, you would do, uh, the convolutional layers and then the categorization, the fully connected layers and then the categorization, but we add just the optical uh, device here at this stage. And so we, to train uh, the, the, the whole training procedure, you have to adapt to the training procedure, but you can train. And what you can show is that you actually increase the robustness to adversarial attacks because you cannot fully characterize, uh, you cannot characterize this optical box uh, with sufficient precision that the uh, the adversarial attack is efficient. Actually, uh, if you if you want to uh, do an adversarial attack, you have to know the system. Uh, there is a called a white box attacks and black box attacks, depending on how much knowledge you have of the system. And what's interesting as well is that you can you can put that on top of already robust system and it Im it improves uh, even the published uh, adversarial attack uh, system. In the literature, it's an extra layer of uh, protection uh, for adversarial uh, attacks. So it's interesting in that case. I mean, the fact that being analog uh, on low precision is, gives you some unexpected benefits. And we did not anticipate that at all. In, to start with, to be honest, we were just fighting to reduce the amount of noise and, uh, until we had this dis discussion with this guy. We said, no, 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 they are, uh, this, this might be interesting for some applications. So I think in terms of uh, Philosophy of what we want to achieve, and this is uh, this is interesting as well. Uh, same type of ideas. Uh, this one with uh, Criteo, another company uh, based in Paris. They do uh, uh, targeted ads and so on. I mean, they, and so on. But they okay for them uh, uh, because of the they do targeted ads. But now there's this new new laws about cookies and so on uh, in Europe. So they uh, they have to guess. What is your behavior, uh, who you are based on your behavior, or not your cookies? Um, so, this is much more complex uh, for that. So, again, Criteo is again an AI company. <laughs> uh, and again, this idea of uh, differential privacy. So, differential privacy is the fact that uh, uh, you train a neural network on privacy sensitive data, uh, like, uh, for instance, uh, medical records. So, you train a, a model to, um, to do some prediction on medical records, but you don't want anyone uh, to go back to individual, uh, from the train neural network, uh, to go back to individual, individual case, right? So you want to, that any single 
case, any single file is sort of lost in the training, but there's no way to interrogate the system so that uh, you can get to one, uh, one particular uh, training sample. Uh, this is super important, that's what's called uh, differential privacy. And again, uh, by using an OPU optical processing unit in the chain, uh, there are some guarantees, uh, like each, each uh, hospital, for instance, would pass the data through the OPU, and there are some guarantees that uh, it's much, much more difficult to go back to the original, uh, original file. Okay, I'm skipping the details, but we, so, somehow it, uh, it's, it's still work in progress, but uh, it, we can train that and it's, it, it's competitive. And uh, another type of application, uh, yes, at least not strictly speaking, uh, machine learning is a uh, randomized numerical linear algebra. It's a type of, uh, okay, you, you all know linear algebra, you, you all have used this uh, routine of linear algebra, uh, like a lay path and so on. Uh, but then, uh, if the dimension gets very, very, very large of the problem, well, either, there are two choices, either you have a, you can make a distributed computation, so you break into a small problem, but uh, it still needs a lot of uh, a big distributed code uh, that can be very challenging. But if, if you are happy sometimes with approximate result, uh, actually what you can do is use this randomized method. The randomized method for linear algebra is to compress using random matrices, and you get an approximate result on the compressed version, uh, and then uh, sometimes you're happy with that and you, you do a first, uh, first thing, but at least you can do that. It's tractable without having to distribute the code. So very simple. Um, just giving it, uh, okay, the dumb example, don't do that. But the dumb example is a metric matrix multiplication, just to give you a flavor of what, how you put that optically. This one is, uh, I mean, don't do that because the, the, the results are lousy, but uh, uh, j just to give you a hint on the, the, the reason uh, what you want to do. So say you want to multiply matrix A by matrix B. Uh, so instead of doing that, uh, you are going to multiply compressed A by compressed B. And uh, the way to compress uh, is to use this random matrix uh, R. So R is a random matrix uh, with Gaussian entries. Uh, so you know that with a random matrix with Gaussian entries, uh, R, R, R transpose is approximately the identity. Right? Uh, so it's a... Uh, well, this is the definition of a, a white noise, the autocorrelation of, uh, and so on and so on. I mean, there are many ways of seeing that. Huh? But, uh, so you know that uh, R, R transpose is approximately an identity. So you put the identity between A and B, approximately. And uh, so this is R, A, R, R transpose B. So you have a compressed A, which is A, R, compressed B, which is R transpose B. And then multiplying uh, these two is much faster, right? Because uh, uh, Instead of having uh, n cube multiplication, you only have n square n. So you, you, this is this is what you get. Uh, um, of course, there is a cost of uh, compressing, but this is typically what we do optically. Uh, optically, we can multiply by uh, random matrices. We are very efficient at, at doing this uh, this compression of data. Uh, the idea is, if the compression of data is free, I mean this is free for us. It's, uh, done optically extremely efficiently, then you can do this multiplication in the compressed domain. And I say don't do that because although you, you gain in computational complexity, the error that you do is very bad. Uh, the, 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 this approximation is, is not that great. Uh, so in terms of appro approximation error, it's not, it's not great in that case. So no, no one is doing that for, for a good reason. And you should not do it, but it's very easy to understand at least on principle, why it should work in terms of complexity versus uh, precision trade-off. This is a uh, But here you've got a better case uh, is to estimate the trace, the trace, uh, the trace operator. Uh, for instance, in graph your network, uh, there is this case where uh, you've got a graph. For instance, uh, it's uh, um, it's a social network. Uh, and you, 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 you are using uh, uh, Facebook, uh, you want to find what are sub-communities in Facebook and so on. So it's a social network, people are interconnected, uh, some people have connections, but of course, not everyone is connected to everyone, right? Uh, so there are some sub-groups sub and you want to detect uh, this, uh, this community. And apparently, there is this uh, uh, 
it's it, it amounts to counting how many triangles and uh, they, this whole theory I, I know nothing about uh, uh, but uh, uh, it's linked to the trace of the cubic value of the adjacent symmetrics so it's uh, it, 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 but the thing is for a large you know, uh, for a large network the adjacent symmetric is very large you don't want to put it to the to the cube right and uh, if, if you have a million nodes uh, uh, you don't want to put this metric to the cube. So what you do instead of you, you use these uh, trace estimator tricks uh, and uh, you compress it using a random matrix. Uh, uh, and actually it's, it's like the, the trace of the compressed matrix to the cube. And here actually it's compressed in both, di in both dimensions. So actually the complexity is uh, reduction is, is, is a lot. And here it's a good approximation with we, we did, uh, like you, you can get, uh, say, 10%, uh, 10%, uh, 10%, if you are happy with a 10% error, uh, then you can divide by five the computation cost. Uh, I mean, this is a trade-off that can be acceptable in some cases. I'm not saying that it's uh, universal, it's just this complexity uh, uh, versus uh, precision trade-off that can be useful in certain cases. There is this case of, uh, Randomized uh, HVD, for instance, you want to do HVD, but uh, MATLAB tells you uh, out of memory, so what do you do? Well, you can, you can again compress, you do randomized HVD, you compress your matrix in the largest dimension, so instead of doing the HVD on, on X, you do the HVD on randomized X, which is X, uh, X hat here, you do the HVD on X hat, and uh, actually this is, you can get the approximation of the whole of the whole HVD by this perturbation theory and so on. So this can be used, like for instance, the HVD is the, the basis for our, in industry for a recommender system. The recommender system, this is really, you have the big matrices and you want to find low rank approximation of, of these matrices. Uh, so this, this has used huge uh, application in the, in the industry for a recommender system. So I'm near the end of my talk, but I started the, yeah, yes, I started on this language model. And I, I went through a very, very uh, twisted uh, path uh, towards uh, optical uh, thing. And, uh, so let's go back to the initial motivation. And, uh, can the optical processing unit train our language model? I said it is a big computing challenge. Uh, so can, can we do it optically? Uh, the answer is, uh, well, I, I don't know, but uh, let's try to figure out. So we put uh, an optical processing unit in, uh, actually in France's uh, largest uh, supercomputer, which is called Jean Z, uh, near, near Paris. Uh, it's in the top 500. Uh, so I, to the best of my knowledge, it is the first time uh, an, an actual photonic coprocessor was put uh, on a supercomputer, uh, as far as I know. So this is, uh, this is Jean Z, uh, like a big, uh, like you've got many rows of this, uh, uh, racks uh, and so on. Rack, 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 and key. Yeah, that's it. That's the one. <laughs> uh, uh, so it, it's actually plugged on, on one node, uh, a very good node uh, of uh, Jean Zé, and some, some users have, have done it. So, okay, can we train language models? It's a big challenge. So the answer is I don't know. <laughs> we are working on it. And this is a, okay, this is a, this is like very, very, don't take any picture, please, of, of that, because it's a, I'm a bit ashamed by that, but this is very funny. This is the first, first few iterations, uh, after a few iterations of a, of a language model, a smallish language model. It, it's interesting because it, it starts to learn a bit of the grammar, but it's complete nonsense. <laughs> but I think it's interesting because the, the language model learns the grammar because- Like small chat. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I call it AI bubble, uh, but, but it's the, the children they learn the vocabulary before the grammar. And here, but it seems the, the model learns the grammar before the, the actual meaning. <laughs> but anyway, what's interesting is that we have to design an uh, alternative training scheme. Where is the optical possibility coming? It's in the training. So instead of using bad, bad propagation, we, we use a, a scheme called uh, direct feedback alignment, uh, uh, which is interesting in direct feedback alignment is that you take the error signal and you feed it back into the deep layers, but all in parallel. 
So it's not a sequential thing. And uh, we, the problem with backpropagation when you scale to a data center type of size is that if you are not careful with your software, the nodes, they will keep waiting for each other because of, of the information bottleneck, the, I would say the, the bandwidth between the two, uh, the compute nodes. Uh, sometimes you will be, will be stuck by communication costs and not by compute costs. And you are, all the computers are idle in this. Uh, so if you want to avoid that, uh, having a more like distributed scheme could be appealing. Uh, and so we, okay, we did not invent uh, the FA, we just, uh, we took it from the literature where, where people thought that it was a toy model, but that couldn't scale. And actually we showed that it could actually scale. Uh, it scaled to modern deep learning architectures, like including transformers. Uh, so, uh, it's a, good, it's a good type of thing. You can train transformers with, uh, with DFA. Uh, uh, neural view uh, synthesis, has what, what's called NERF, uh, so NLP, recommended system, and so on. So all the modern type of uh, architectures can be trained using, uh, using this uh, DFA scheme. Uh, what, what's interesting as well is that we only, use, we only use the optical processing unit in the feedback loop for the training. So once you've trained your model, you can just take it and uh, make the inference on your favorite uh, on your favorite server. I mean, that's okay. You got your coefficients. You don't need it to use the model. It's only used to to speed up, hopefully, uh, the, the the very painful stage of training, and uh, you can you can deploy. It. So for the industry, it's interesting. So can the UPU train large language model? The answer is yes, it can. But I'm not sure it. Uh, at the moment, it's not uh, at the scale uh, of this very large, useful language model. It's still work in progress. Uh, I, I have some clues, but I have, I have no proof on uh, what will be the saving in terms of uh, speed and energy and so on eventually when it, uh, when it scales. So it's still work in progress. It, it works. We've shown it works, we've shown it can train. How much faster? This is still work in progress. And, and uh, yes, and I would say also it's, this is a big uh, software engineering problem. At the moment, we are hiring more like software engineer, not scientists. No scientists, uh, please uh, sh shut up and don't give me your ideas. <laughs> please make this uh, code uh, parallel, uh, very efficient, and so on. I want software engineers. <laughs> and uh, so it's work in progress. And just uh, uh, by way of conclusion, more like a philosophical way. So. Uh, there is always this debate uh, versus uh, free space versus integrated photonics. So now it, I hope uh, that was also in a previous talk. Uh, there are some cases where free space can be an interesting alternative. Uh, I'm not saying that it is the, this is the universal answer. Uh, many, many use cases, the world is huge. Uh, and there are some, some niche where uh, uh, either one uh, can, uh, can, be, uh, can be interesting. Uh, uh, it's interesting as well in terms of industry because we are not, we do not have to design and uh, produce co new components. We are just repurposing uh, components that exist for uh, for smartphones or video projectors and so on. And we we do experiment with that so in terms of production, uh, R&D, uh, cost and speed, and this is uh, this is actually an advantage. Um, uh, yes, so it's uh, we. Even by repurposing components that, that you can get on, off the shelf, you can still be competitive. Uh, uh, you can still do a petaot type of, uh, of, the, of comp computation. So here in our case, uh, uh, you give away programmability uh, to bypass the Feynman bottleneck, uh, you know, the bottleneck to access memory, to ac access the coefficients value in the memory. That is something that's that is usually the bottleneck uh, in, in the chips, right? Uh, and that takes most of the energy to get data in and out of the memory, from the memory to the chip and so on. So, uh, and it's this randomized approach, uh, it's also well matched to the statistical nature of machine learning. You don't, machine learning really, this is a fancy name for, for statistics in high dimension. So by having this randomized approach, I think it's, it's a natural tool uh, in this type of, this is a good application case, uh, machine learning for this type of randomized approach. Um, yeah, so 
also it's interesting extra property that we did not anticipate, uh, say for privacy or websites and so on. Um, okay, and just to, if you want to, still if you want to recover programmability, you can use this wavefront uh, shaping techniques. Uh, for instance, if I have this, my transmission metric here fixed by design, H, but if I, if I have a, say, a diagonal matrix uh, before that, uh, I can approximate the desired uh, transmission matrix uh, in some cases. So, so for arbitrary D and uh, for good mixing H, uh, uh, you can get very good approximation on a few modes. Uh, and it, it, it works in small dimensions, so this is not very this is usually not a good idea for classical computing, but if you do quantum computing, you are usually uh, restricted to a small mode, a small number of modes anyway. Uh, so that may, may be an interesting thing to do. And so this is what we, this is a small project that we have on the side, which is to leverage some of the know-how we have in the, in the, in the SLM and, and so on. And this was also something that we took from uh, Silvan's lab. Uh, um, there was this, uh, this article uh, a couple of years ago that presented a very nice proof of concept where you use a multi-mode fiber uh, as a mixer and you shape the input SLM into the modes of the multi-mode fiber uh, to get the design of transmission. Uh, for, uh, so you can get any arbitrary unitary uh, matrix at small dimension, but still uh, 8 inputs and 38 outputs, what we have shown uh, recently in this paper that we just published, which is a dimension that are still, uh, I think, for this type of technology, this is a record, record high, I uh, think, in, in this type of, uh, type of things. So, um, yeah, just, uh, it, it has good, uh, good fidelity uh, and, and also good stability, stability in time, so we, we've shown that the stability once it's been characterized, it can, it can stay stable over like two weeks uh, with exactly the same characteristics. So it's, uh, again, uh, we try to make it uh, towards real life application. We like real life application. I mean, uh, so we, we try to do it uh, like as a hackable device uh, with a very good uh, Python interface. And, uh, so again, for the chip, like most people in the uh, in quantum uh, photonic uh, computing, they use the integrated chips, uh, they, they are great. But in some cases, there are some alternatives. Like here, I'm using this multi-mode fiber. You can do it for cheap. It's very cheap uh, to, to, to design. Uh, and so we, we believe also that there is a space for, for free space in this type of, of computation. So this is my last, my last slide. It's uh, really the high level uh, philosophy. Uh, there was this great paper for the hardware lottery by uh, an engineer at, uh, I think she left now. She, she was at uh, Google Time, but she left a month ago. Uh, but anyway, this, she has this paper, great paper two years ago for the hardware lottery. And uh, she says that tooling, especially hardware, we have no idea. I mean, we, we have completely absorbed the idea that we use some hardware to do the research in machine learning and AI. But actually, we are so much constrained uh, by, uh, by, by what we have in terms of hardware, computing, and so on. So we need to have new hardware to experiment a new, new AI ideas. This is a, a good way of experimenting. But as she says, that hardware lottery, because the hardware, sometimes you have a good ticket that gives you good ideas. Uh, but sometimes, uh, I mean, um, so the, just the philosophy that what we do at Lighten is maybe I'm not saying this is an answer, this is just giving you uh, lottery tickets for you to play with. And maybe you will, you will win, maybe you, you, you won't win, but at least you get more, more tickets. And uh, there are all these, these type of questions that we want to address, but like going into directions that people uh, uh, have not explored before, like non final man, randomized computation, and uh, uh, this is okay. I can always have this discussion about compute bound versus uh, bandwidth bound anyway, but uh, that's, uh, that's it. Uh, um, yeah, we, we welcome the community. We try to encourage uh, doing, uh, we are a startup, but we like, uh, we like researchers. So we, uh, that's our DNA, so we, on our website, we have articles and so on. And please reach to us if you have any questions. Gracias.
time for the FAT in four minutes. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for this great talk. There's some questions. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I was curious uh, what is bottlenecking the clock speed? What is bottlenecking the clock speed for your device? What the making sorry, the clock speed. Ah, the clock speed. Yes, uh, at the moment, uh, the clock speed is a, a few kilohertz, uh, which is relatively slow, uh, of course, if you, if you compare to a uh, chip sensor. Um, yes, we have. We, uh, uh, but I think the question maybe is what, what importance to limit? Is it the SLM or, or what, what? Uh, At the moment, you use the DMD. Uh, DMD technology. Well, it's the same, so it's DMD, the, the DMDs, uh, they can go, uh, I think some DMDs have been driven to 40 kilohertz, so we could get an order of magnitude uh, faster uh, with the DMD. But then you need to have, a, like, imagine the, uh, on, a, on a CMOS sensor at 40 kilohertz, you need a lot of uh, light power and so on. And actually, uh, the problem is not so much, that, that's my, my remark about uh, compute bound versus bandwidth bound. At the end, the bottleneck is not so much the component, it is really the bandwidth and how much data you can get into the system and how much data you can get in and out, really. But uh, we, really, we are at the age where the, the bottleneck is not really in the component, this is a real engineering problem in terms of uh, data in and out of your system. Uh, and uh, you, you end up being uh, bottlenecked by communication trust. But still, of course, you need to put the question. Can we continue this? Yes. So, uh, can we estimate number of, let's say, peaks? So, you mentioned number of pixels, right? Yes. In the process. So, how many pixels would you need a bit for? Uh, or maybe? Yeah. Or approximately. For, for estimate. So, basically, we have 20 kilohertz. Yes. So, I mean, only, yeah. how many bits you can? Oh, uh, for, the, for, the, for the same bandwidth? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, whatever. So we are not in it. So. We are not so, in it. So, so basically, I want bits per second, some number. So because 20 kilohertz, yes. so it, 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 it is clock. So yes. now we need to put number of bits yes, yes, yes. per this clock. One million. One million. So one, one million bits, one million bits already moves you to gigahertz. Uh, well, it's one million bits, but you've got eight bits per pixel uh, on the CMOS sensor. So it's one million bytes uh, per clock uh, by 20 kilohertz. Yeah, uh, well, this is what I'm trying to say. So yeah. you're, you're already in some um, We are already in the USB no, 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 we, we, are, we are already beyond, beyond the USB 3. We are at PCI uh, Express uh, 3. Point, uh, something. So we, we, we are not, we could go, well, say, one order of magnitude with the current protocol of, uh, of communication speed with the PCI Express uh, slots that we have, but we, we cannot be two order of magnitude. What I'm trying to say that you use DD from the shelf, right? Yes. So if somebody will develop something similar, using whatever integrated photonics with high speed, you immediately jump to telecommunication uh, speeds because of number of pixels and bits you... Yes, but you still have to integrate that into the PCI Express. I mean, in terms of engineering, you, this is not a whole local computer by itself. It has to be, it has to talk to the GPU board, it has to talk to the CPU and so on. So in terms of engineering, in terms of... Uh, I mean, yeah. yeah, but I'm talking only about the optical part. Because, you, you know, in optical communications, people use all degrees of freedom. So yes. polarizations, they yeah, use yeah, frequency, yeah. And, and still using expanded frequency. But it's already a huge talk about special division multiplexing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how it will be done, it is still to be decided. So I, I, I just want to say that your approach seems like very competitive to it's very competitive. Uh, yes, no, but you, you're right. I, I could get, with the standard communication protocol of PCI Express, etc., I could get maybe one order of magnitude faster, but mm, then I have to invent a, a new NDMD, a new communication uh, protocol, etc. So this is a limit of the, of the shared technology. Yeah, uh, it I, is I, under development now. That's yeah, what yeah. I'm trying to say, yeah, that yeah. if you make 
message clear yes. that some people look at the development of yes, yes. higher speed, basically special yes, yes, yes. Uh, modulators. Yeah, yeah, because at the moment they don't see it and they use this yeah, yeah, yeah. multi mode multi-mode fibers in a very different context. There, yeah. there are some projects for uh, specialized modulator in, in the megahertz. Uh, yeah. uh, It's still about tooling, but yeah. as you mentioned. Uh, my question is on the physics. I, uh, I was wondering about the scattering. Uh, how do you make sure that the scattering is sort of truly rational? Because the intuition would be that it would be quite localized around the interface. But do you just make a stop thinking that? Or how do you make sure it's yes. localized? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's much if I don't want to answer this question, but it's a matter of uh, thickness. Uh, yeah, it's a matter of thickness. So if you have a medium that is, let's say, 10 or 20 transport bit frequencies, you are sure uh, that uh, light has been scattered enough. Yes, thanks. Thank you for this talk. Uh, my question how can you use the optical uh, processing units to uh, enhance the performance of reinforcement learning? You have a slide with the reinforcement learning. Yes. And this day, let me how you can do that. Yes, yes, yes. And this is, unfortunately, this is something we don't have much publication about. This is one of the key things where we had a good idea and then the, the student left and uh, we have a result without any, any uh, actually we, you know, reinforcement learning for those who, who don't know, this is this technique where, uh, that was used for like the Go, uh, you know, the Go game where uh, uh, the best Go player in the world was beaten by the computer uh, with reinforcement learning. The reinforcement learning is learning by feedback. Uh, you have a feedback and then it helps you learn. So, so the Go game was playing against itself and learn against itself to, to, be, to be better and better. And here we use, we use the optical processing unit um, with this technique called uh, uh, to to find that in the history of uh, past states, in, the, in your past history, uh, which state is uh, the closest to the, to the state you are currently at. So your, your system is at, in a given state. Uh, and then you, have I, have I already encountered the situation that was similar in the past? And so you have to compare two states uh, and you want to recover very quickly uh, with this method called uh, locality sensitive hashing it's sort, of, sort of hashing techniques to recover in the, in the whole space of uh, past states, which one uh, you look for a nearest neighbor. Uh, I would say nearest neighbor in the compressed domain using hashing techniques. So again, yeah, it's not a version of the order of the SVD, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, is, this is very similar. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You, you, instead of, uh, actually, we, we try how to play uh, these uh, classic, uh, classic games that I used to play. Uh, other kids, so it shows my age. Um, but uh, actually, you, you can play, uh, you can learn how to play Pac Man uh, with, with this. And we, that's what the student did, uh, actually, learning, learning how to play Pac Man. Uh, um, it's uh, so it really, it's really based on a screenshot. A uh, screenshot is, is your state, the state of, of, your, uh, of, of your system at a given moment. And so you want to compare two screenshots uh, to decide whether you are in a similar situation or in a different situation. And we do that in a compressed domain. Instead of comparing the two screenshots, we compare the compressed version of the, of the screenshot. And because of the random matrix properties, uh, it preserves the distances. So two, two screenshots that are close uh, will be close in the compressed domain. Two screenshots that are far away will be far away in the compressed domain. Due to this, uh, I mean, there is a whole uh, John Sandino's first lemma, <laughs> the concentration of major. I mean, they, if you want to do fancy math, you can do fancy math. Uh, but, uh, and that's it. You almost insisted that your medium, which you use for scattering, is not programmable. Yes. So, what if somebody learned a way to actually to, to introduce? Some programming in scattering because in principle yeah, yeah, yeah. it is a not non-solvable problem. So would it help you? Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. I would love to have uh, someone uh, like 
with a 3D printer, uh, a 3D print from the uh, given matrix, a video completion matrix from the given emitter. But this is a very hard, uh, extremely, extremely challenging problem. It's not impossible, but it's uh, super hard. But yeah, yeah, I would love to have that. Uh, I'm not talking about complete programmability, but of some elements. So basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you can imagine everything in between. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think you showed this compression technique, the transpose matrix R. How do you get access to the transpose matrix? Right. Yeah, that's that's the one. Okay, if I if I know how to do A R uh, R transpose B equal B R transpose transpose. So uh, I, if I know how to do uh, uh, if I if I know how to do one, I know how to do the other one. I can just transpose my. I think you have the transpose in the wrong one to the right hand side. Do you use transpose B instead? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, okay, yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. So if I know how to do that, it's just a matter of transposing to get the other one. Then I think we are at the end, so let's thank the whole again. That was the end of the session. And yes, Claudio, you want to announce the next uh, webcam, the very webcam, webcam to start. So there is a sort of uh, some wine and something to eat. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for the live lessons. Yeah, that's done. Yeah, yeah. 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 See you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Next <to change>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Maybe we'll stop something. Uh, yeah, we'll stop the recording.